Silencer Central. Folks, if you want to learn something new right alongside me, check it out at silencercentral.com. I've never put a suppressor on any of my weapons, but I'm going to start now. And I'm using Silencer Central to help get me started because they walk you through the whole process. To include, you can ship the rifle to them, they'll thread it, they'll put it on, and they will ship it back. And you can make payments on the whole thing while you wait for all the licensing to get approved, which they take care of for you. It's a great process, and it's a great company, American manufacturer, right there in South Dakota. And we are really excited to be partnering with them. So check it out at silencercentral.com or give them a call at 888-781-8778 and let them know that you heard it on the Western Huntsman. Hoffman Boots is my go-to boot. I love the Explorers in the 8-inch, and they've got the Vibram sole, totally waterproof, no break-in period. They just glue your feet to the mountain. You can't ask for more out of a boot. And you don't have to break the bank to get a pair. So check it out at HoffmanBoots.com. Again, another American company. A local North Idaho friend of mine who runs this company decided to make some great hunting boots for all people that are serious about getting into the backcountry to chase elk and deer and bear and everything else out there. So check it out at HoffmanBoots.com. Use promo code all caps lock Huntsman 10 at checkout to save you 10%. Guys, I'm pretty excited. I got one of my favorite return guests coming back to the show. You're in for a good one. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here... We provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. gentlemen welcome to this episode of the western huntsman podcast this is jim huntsman your host coming at you from the broken time studio and brought to you by eastman's hunting journals guys if you have not checked out the eastman's hunting journals uh mule deer course you still have time i know we are getting right down to it but uh, i'd highly recommend you check it out at eastmans.com uh, and see if you can get that uh, get that rolling before you get out to the field because i know archery season has opened up in a lot of states uh this week i am well I'm just going to, I'll totally fess up. I, I think, what what is today, Garrett? <laughs> August 17th or something? or um, 18th, I believe. Is it the 18th? Okay, so it's August 18th. I'm, uh, I'm recording this. This is probably, by the time this comes out, I, I think it's going to be September. Uh, we, we've got, uh, I don't know. We might have to switch them around, though. It depends on what me and Garrett <laughs> talk about. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Guys, this week joining me uh, is... Somebody I've I've had on the show a few times. I think we've we've talked hunting and woodsmanship and all sorts of stuff in the past mm-hmm. and, and drumming. Um, Garrett is one of my like go to guys when it comes to real technical archery kind of stuff. Garrett Weaver from On Point Podcast. Uh, I haven't had him on for like a year or something. It's been way too long. But Garrett, welcome oh, yeah. back, brother. Thanks for having me, man. And and um, I can't believe it's been already a year. Like I was been thinking yeah. about you a lot lately, and then you then you got a hold of me. He's like, oh no way, like. It's just kind of weird how that happens. Like you just start thinking about somebody, then they call you or, or your phone rings and it's them. It's just kind of that happened the other day when you, it, when you texted me. It really is. What's funny is I'll, I'll be like driving along and I'll be like, God, I wonder what Garrett's been up to, man. I haven't talked to him in forever. <laughs> I need to hit him up. And I, I always like getting you on the show. And so well, uh, yeah. I, I'm sitting there with my wife or something and I, I opened Instagram and you posted some reel. I, I think it, I don't know if it was bear seat or bear hunting, wh- whatever mm. it was. He posted mm-hmm. the reel and it was like, "Oh man, okay, I need to do it right now." So I, I hit you up. I'm like, "Dude, let's record." <laughs> right on. Well, before we get too far into this, have you watched the movie Whiplash yet that I sent you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, no. So <laughs> so when yeah. you sent that to me, dude, I was uh-huh. packing up and moving that old house in Hayden. Mm-hmm. 
and then we moved out onto our bare land, and that DVD is like crammed in a box in my storage unit. <laughs> and so now, oh, man. now we got the new place, and I'm gonna start on as soon as we. I've got to we got to like paint and replace some floors and and whatnot, but. Mm-hmm. As soon as I get all that shit out of the storage, I'll, I'll, I will watch it, and I, I promise I'll send it back to you. Oh, no, just keep it. Like, you can stream it, I think, for free online now, too. So, Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely online. And, and uh, yeah, from, from one drummer, you know, musician to another, you're going to love that, that movie. So. I know. I, I was looking forward to that, man. And then it was like, you sent that right at the time where we were we were just packing up, moving to Bear Land. and. <laughs> That's literally right. what we did, man. We pulled up. Nobody had ever lived on this land before. I had my little hunting trailer. We pull up with a with a U-Haul truck, and there's nothing but brush, trees, and dirt, man. <laughs> so That's I didn't have any way to watch it. What hey, else it's better is, than when I got at heads, crackheads, and and whatever. Else. Yeah, very true. I need to get out of this. I need to get out. Of, I don't live in a city. I call it a city. It's where I live. It's like twenty two thousand people is the population. So I'm like, I need to get out of the city and get back out into the country. But where are you? People, where are you towns. exactly? Roseburg, Oregon. So, um, oh, gotcha, Roseburg. Mm-hmm. Right off I five. So we get a lot of drugs. It's kind of like a drug uh, corridor right where we live. I I can literally see I five from my house. Gotcha. So, so that's not the best place. Because <clears throat> I hit you up when I was in. Where were, where were we? Newport? Does You're like Newport like? or somewhere. You're way the yeah, hell up there. Coastal, yeah. coastal yeah. Oregon. I had a work thing, a little conference thing for work, and uh, whenever I do that, I just I take the family. And we rent we rented a little beach house, mm-hmm. and I'm like, I know I I just seen coming coming through this pass. I we saw like three bull elk <laughs> standing in this, <laughs> cur- you know, just antlers barely coming in, and um. That made me think. I, I was like, dude, I know Garrett lives out here somewhere. Uh, I thought it was mm-hmm. coastal Oregon, but uh, you're you're down a little further south. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we I'm I'm about an hour and twenty minutes from the from the you know beach, but um, yeah, I remember you texted me like, hey, it's not so hard over here. I found him on accident, you know. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, totally. Uh, like, yeah. I, I bet they're a little tougher in September. A little bit, a little bit, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's. Yeah, it's a it, it could be a, an amazing state, you know, but um, and it's it's getting harder to live here. It seems like every year for me, but I, I just love the diversity that we have of wildlife and and landscape. We have everything here, so it's kind of hard to move. You guys do, man. We we I mean, we we drove all the way through, and this isn't the first time I've done it. Pre COVID, I was coming over to that area every year for mm-hmm. the same conference, you know, and um i i'm always i'm always amazed at oregon it's it is like there is a there is a lot of disparity in in the landscape from like central oregon and then you get into mm-hmm. I, I what is it bend uh right before you get up and over that pass yeah um yeah and then you drop down into that it's like this green lush valley type area and and then you go over like another pass that looks like a freaking jungle. And then you're on the, on the coast all of a sudden, you know, it's like, there's just yeah. a, it's, it's a really cool, diverse landscape that is super interesting and enticing for, I, I think any outdoorsman. Um, but I gotta tell you, man, like the, the weird, uh, like I, I stopped, I thought this guy was like coming <laughs> at me or some shit. I was, I'm trying to pump gas and apparently you're not supposed to. And he comes in and oh. I thought he was messing with me, man. He's like, Give me your debit card. And I'm like, who the fuck are you, man? What do you mean, give me your debit card. Ready to fight him. <laughs> I, I really was. He's like, no, no, no. I have to pump your gas. I have to pump your gas. I'm like, no, I don't That's want hilarious. you to pump my gas. He's like, no, you have to. Yeah, I have to pump your gas. Like, What's up with that? We we just, uh, we uh, the politicians just passed a law where we can pump our own gas now. Um, and it was kind of funny. Like like one of the first days, my wife was like, I, I, I heard they were going to pass it and I didn't know it went through, but. My wife's like, we're at the gas station. It's like, you know, like today's the first day we get to pump our own gas. I'm like, oh, cool. I, I have a work truck and a pack pride card. So I, you know, for my work yeah. truck and I have to fill up all the time. So it's like, I'm used to it. But um, we watched this chick um, in front of us in this four, forerunner and she had organ plates and she, had, I, I, she, I don't know if she figured it out. Like she had to have one of the attendants come over and help her pump her own gas because she didn't know how to do it and i'm like <laughs> wow it's just, man. It's, it's just insane like other people from other states are like wow that's that's really stupid i'm like well yeah but if you've never done it i could see i don't know she was she must have been half retarded because it's really really easy it's, it's not like it's rocket not science hard. or anything 
It's like that. Yeah. There's like that saying that goes around, but I, it's like when you were nine, your parents never made you get out in negative temperatures to pump the gas in the car, <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it was crazy. just funny seeing people, people, local people struggle to pump their own gas. It was like, oh my gosh. But, but you know, all that, you know, pump your gas, not pump your gas. The, the, the hunting that Oregon offers is, is super impressive, man. Um, I, I've been yeah. watching, I've been watching you knock down stuff, uh, you know, for years now. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm always amazed at, like the the type of terrain i mean you flat out i always bitch about how thick like uh northern idaho is you know and in western mm-hmm. montana as we call it a jungle here uh but after driving through it man especially this last this last spring i was really paying attention like it, it's like legitimately a jungle and everything's pokey yeah. tell me a little yeah, bit about I, that yeah I, everything here wants to grab poke and and prod and it just it's i mean i i quit wearing so the first year i bought the the, the obsidians came out from first light um Mm -hmm. been a few years ago now um i went through two pairs of pants and two or three shirts the first week of bow season the first year they came out really and i sent yeah i sent the yeah because they were the the coast was just shredding them and um and i you know don't avoid brush um there's a funny story actually to this story so i sent them back to first light it's like i need the corrugated or the you know the tougher pants i think they're the guide pants or whatever they they call them and um, those ones do a lot better here but they still they still get you know they still they don't last extremely good but yeah um i got a hold of the customer service guy um i think his name was rex if i remember right and rex had the audacity to say you know in order to have a successful stock you should try to avoid brush in the future <laughs> I was like, Rex. I said, I, yeah, I was like, dude, you've never, I kind of went off on, I'm like, listen, you've, I, you probably never been to Oregon, so I'm not going to take it personal, but like you come to Oregon and then write that same email and tell me you're not a freaking idiot because this shit is <laughs> thick. Everything wants to grab you. Everything wants to poke you. It's just like, dude, like I, I, I don't live in Wyoming. I don't live know in in an open state i live on the coast of oregon and your your shit doesn't work here like i wear carhartts now i i, I, I hunt in carhartts yeah, i was gonna say you might you might want to up your game to something like carhartt if, if they're ripping yeah that and um i i shredded one pair of carhartts and um you know granted this is probably harder than most people but i i shredded one pair of carhartts the first week of season like i just right around the shin ankle area i just it just they started ripping i was like Oh, well, you know, at least I, got, I brought, you know, two pairs, but, yeah. um, it's just, you know, it's just, it takes tough clothing. Like you ever heard of predator camo? Yeah. I've heard of, <laughs> I've heard of them. Are they, are they made in Oregon? I don't know. Uh, that's what I grew up hunting and it's like basically like camo jeans. I yeah. mean, that's the, it's like almost like a denim camo. It's and, old school stuff, those, but it makes you sweat like school. a mofo, man. Yeah. But you bl- like, that was like, me- I, I swear to God, that was like meant for the Oregon coast. So I grew up hunting in predator camo and you're walking around out in public. You look like an idiot, but you start getting in the woods <laughs> and you like disappear. But it's just, um, we need stuff that's a l- little bit more durable than, than that. So, um, I haven't gone back to wearing predator camo yet, but those, those car hearts, you know, they're just like a charcoal gray and, and they work just fine. And, Honestly, just camo patterns are more for the hunters than yeah. than they are for the animals, in my opinion. But um, yeah, I, I you know, I, I could, yeah, I mean, unless you're like turkey hunting and stuff like that, I get it. But you know, these big game animals, I mean, I could kill something in them. Well, look what Dirk and Trent did. You know, Nacho Man and Randy oh, yeah. Savage. They killed. Yeah, and Jason yeah, Phelps. I mean, that's he just did proving... the yellow outfit. Mm-hmm. Well, who was he? Like Hulk Hogan or some shit? Hulk Hogan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah come on now. That just proves my point. So. <laughs> And they you all know. killed something. <laughs> exactly. Nope. Exactly. Well, Fred Barry even said it. He's just, you know, just sit your ass still. That's the best camo. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but he's like stillness or calmness is your best camo. Yeah. So, he, he said, he said, your grandpa hunted in a red plaid shirt or red flannel shirt. Think about that or something like that, you know? And yes. And he's super right. You know, there, there's circumstantially, I think it totally is dependent on each scenario because there's been times when, um, I've been all camoed out and I've had elk right on top of me and they're staring right like they're staring a hole through me, but they can't mm-hmm. make me out. 
And and there's other times where it, I feel like I'm in the same situation. I'm in the shadows. I'm in, you know, I'm not right in the direct sunlight. And and the, the elk maybe are further away and they bust me and they, they see me like clear as day and, and take off. And then there's other times, dude, where I'll be in jeans and a t-shirt back in the day back when i thought i was a cowboy man i would hunt <laughs> i would hunt in wrangler jeans and cowboy boots uh and and just like a white t-shirt or, or uh or even even those pearl those old pearl snap cowboy shirts you know um <laughs> yeah when you think you're a cowboy that's the kind of shit you wear and and so that's that's I, I would literally wear that stuff and i'd have deer walk right right by me and not even notice me yeah you know and so it's, yeah. i don't know it's so hard to say i like i've always wondered how in the hell they test like, uh, you know, you, you'll hear those studies. Well, here's how deer see. This is how dogs see. Like, how do they know that? How do they test that? I, I don't understand. I have no idea. That's above my pay grade, <laughs> but I, I can tell you that it's, it's the, it's the figure of a person. It's the outline. So like, mm -hmm. if you did want to buy like a, uh, what are they, those, uh, leafy outfits? Um, what's the name oh, of the those ghillie suit? The ghillie suit, like I, I could see, I could buy into a ghillie. I'm not going to buy one, but like if somebody is wearing a ghillie suit, I'm like, I get it. I, I understand. I, I mean, would, you, I, I totally you, buy. Yeah, one. I'd wear one in my I next meeting at work. <laughs> but like breaking up your outline, um, like you know, your head and your shoulders and your your arms and your legs, like that to me is important. Which is where standing still comes in and moving slowly and smoothly, not you know, acting like a little crackhead out there moving and grabbing your binoculars and switching you know yeah. switching around it's just i don't know it's just com to me it's just common sense but um you know camo looks cool and and it's more for the consumer than it is for the animal i mean granted turkey hunters um they have a they have a, a reason to buy camo and stuff but um yeah it's just I, the, the the older i get the less i care about what i'm wearing as long as it performs um to my yeah, liking absolutely i i really don't care yeah, I, I got a question for you, a little uh, strain off the topic. Mm -hmm. the, and, and this is kind of what popped in my head when, when I was driving through there. In some of those areas, we, we're talking about how thick and brushy and, and like it's, it's like this legitimate jungle in a sense. And you're still always knocking down bears. Um, yeah. You, you guys can't bait, right? No, uh, uh, and we, it's pretty simple. You just hunt where you can see. <laughs> so what, what do you mean by that? Are you finding like clear cuts? Are you hunting yeah, a lot of yeah. logging country kind of thing? Oh yeah. So I will send you, when I get off the phone with you, I'll send you a picture of my Onyx and, um, you'll have to kind of look through all like, I probably have close to 500, um, marks and just my, you know, a 20 square mile here. But, um, but you can see there's, there's, you know, in a little snapshot, there'll be 50 or 60 units you can see you know it's mm -hmm. just clear cut after clear cut after clear cut the whole whole oregon coast for the most part minus you know like national forest or the elliott state forest and stuff like that which there's logging units in there too just not near as much but i mean like when i was bear hunting here recently when we had our bear hunt winter um come here um we were just bouncing from unit to unit to unit to unit we weren't going you know more than a mile between units i mean it was just every time like we'd get out of the truck 30 30 times in, a, in an evening or something like that, you know, it'd be insane how many units you can get to. And what do you mean? Are you, you're just, you're going to these different units and you're spot checking and then if nothing there kind of yeah. go, go to the next kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, my, my theory, um, you know, the, the way that I've developed my, the way that I hunt bears and it's super common, um, is, I mean, it's pretty common sense. Again, you know, if you have an isolated food source, you could sit because it's an isolated food source. But when you have, a million little food plots. Just imagine having a million food plots for the Eastern guys. Um, you're going to probably need to cover more ground because you can't put all your eggs in one basket when there's a million baskets out there. So yeah. um, you just have to cover a ton of ground because there's food sources everywhere. There's, there's water everywhere. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a numbers game. So if I know a bear is using a unit and he was there yesterday or the day before, and, and I can, you know, see all the crap he's leaving and I can see the bushes he's tearing into. Um, I, I will play the odds. Um, I'm going to do whatever produces me the best odds of killing a bear that day. So if I have to cover ground, I'll cover ground. If I have a bear that I've located that I want to shoot and I think he'll be back, I'll play the odds that he'll be back. So it's just, yeah, it's just an, for me, it's just a numbers game. Whatever that day is going to produce me the best odds of killing a bear. I will, I will use that tactic. 
I just I've I've always wondered that because I I take a look at where I bear hunt up in the panhandle of Idaho. It there's not a lot of clear cut. It's not like they log the crap out of it. There's areas where they do, and and I love those mm-hmm. areas for other reasons. But I never see bears in them. So uh, I I go mm-hmm. to you know these these areas back on the national forest where it's not like there's there's these giant clear cuts where bears are always popping up. I mean it is thick timber. And so we, we kind of have to bait or you have to have hounds. Um, right. And there's exceptions to every rule. In fact, I'm looking at the, I just got my uh, uh, my bear hide back from uh, my buddy Ty. Shout out to, to Oaks Unlimited for, for the, the bear hide here. Um, and I'm looking at it right now and I'm thinking like, I, you're consistent, man. You're, you're super consistent every year when it comes to bear hunting. Me, mm-hmm. I, now this last spring, the the total focus I, I didn't care if I was going to get a bear my my focus was getting my girls tagged down on a bear I want them to get their first bear and we almost we almost got there man but uh, a, a little miss a little high uh, you know it happens lessons learned um, but mm-hmm. we spent a lot of time packing in bait and we're you know packing these barrels up and we're watching these bait sites and you'd think that that would make it easy, especially when you consider the density of, of the bear population here. Right. And, and, and you're like, I, I'm like, how is Garrett over there knocking down these bears in this <laughs> same as thick country as we do, as, as we mm-hmm. have, if not thicker and definitely pokier. And he's not running bait and he's still getting these bears. Like we, we worked our ass off and I could, I only got my, I gave my daughter had one opportunity on one bear and in in a month, that's that was our only shot. Oh, that's crazy! It, it, it was that's a, crazy. It was a rough. It was a rough spring season for us, man. Yeah, I mean, I've got a buddy who hunts on, on the Cascades, so that's that first big um, mountain range pass bend that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, he he does extremely well. I've got a couple buddies that do it, um, but they hunt um, isolated food sources, so there's not near as much logging on the Cascades. Um, it's an area of contention um, with a lot of the hunters here and, and just the way that we manage our forests. But, um, you know, we don't have a lot of clear cuts on the, on the Cascades hardly anymore. Mm-hmm. And you can get that elevation where you get that, you know, those berry patches really up high. And when you find a food source like that, you can, you know, if it was me, I would sit. I wouldn't cover a ton of ground um, unless there was a ton of berries around. But, um it's just, you kind of just have to play your terrain. I, I, I don't have any really experience outside of Oregon hunting bears. I don't have any actually yeah. that I can think of. And so like my special, my specialty is, is really like I could go kill a bear on the Cascades. I know I could get it done, but my specialty is the coast. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, why would I travel, you know, two hours when I can kill in 20 minutes from my house? So, oh yeah, that's kind of my, my philosophy too. Other than, I don't know. There, there's, uh, there's a few parts of like Wyoming I'd love to go black bear hunting in, but other than that, um, yeah, yeah. man. Well, no, that's cool. And I, uh, yeah, it's just it's fun watching that, and it's it's just interesting. I always I always think of that when <laughs> when you post, oh, you know, uh, dead bear, and it's like, man, <laughs> right. how in the hell did he do that? And it is super uh, thick, but yeah, dude, cool. we we struggled. Um, so we, uh, for, for folks that don't know, we had a big bear hunt giveaway. Um, it was a competition that I used, um, the hunt league app with my buddy, Jared owns it super good dude. And I used his app to host the giveaway. Well, we, we selected the winner, uh, this spring and it was a year long competition where you tracked your season. And then I just, I just random, not randomly. I chose who won, um, based off of just who I wanted to take hunting. And, um, it was a guy actually from Portland. And oh, he really? earned it. I mean, he made, yeah, I told him, I'm like, you're going to have a really tough time because I want to take somebody from out of state to experience Oregon. So you're really going to have to earn this. And he did. He went above and beyond and just kicked everybody else's ass in the competition. Nice. And, and, um, he'd never killed a bear, never shot at a bear, never shot past a hundred yards. And we had to work our asses off for three days. Um, which I know sounds stupid, but, uh, for three days while well, it was a really hard hunt. But on the third day, we finally got a bear down. And then, um, it was like, this it was way harder than it should have been you know i think that super moon had something to do with it but Mm -hmm. the last couple the last couple fall um fall openers have been really tough and and there's some other guys that i talked to um that are extremely extremely good bear hunters um and they're struggling too the same time like when i'm struggling it seems like they're struggling and 
Yeah. And so we're trying to figure out some of the pieces of the puzzle um, of, you know, why are these bears acting the way they do in certain times? But so we're learning every year, um, you know, as, as, a, as a group, we're getting better every year. So hopefully we can keep uh, keep figuring them out. But, yeah, it's just really interesting. Like we struggled really bad. And then this spring was really bad for finding big bears. Um, all the guys I was talking to, there's a few big bears killed. But um, last year was phenomenal. I'd never seen so many big bears. And I was just hoping it was going to be another year like that. And it was just kind of like the year of dinks. It was just yeah, it was kind everywhere of like that we here, man. It's 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 always uh, I, I'm always I always notice that like where there's these consistencies or these trends, whether it's just like a regional thing, like what you're talking about there in Oregon, or you know even across the West, it was uh, when obviously when I when I set a bait barrel for a bear, uh, obviously I've got a camera on it, right? And so uh-huh. I get copious amounts of pictures of of bears, and I like that because it it gives me a really good understanding. Um, of what's out there and, and helps us get a little bit more picky. You know, there was, there was this little raccoon looking bear that my daughter could have shot and we, we, <laughs> you know, didn't want to do that. And then the, the, she shot at this, uh, it was a mid sized bear. Uh, but out of all the hundreds and hundreds of pictures of bears, um, that, that I got over, a, I don't know, it was like a, I guess I set the camera way before we started hunting. So, so technically about six weeks. I had that camera out there. In fact, my other camera's still up on that other bait site. I need to go get that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, there there was only like three or four bears that really caught my attention. You know, like that mm-hmm. like that eighteen plus inch kind of kind of caliber. Because uh, yeah. this is in Alaska, we don't get those you know tanks like that. But every once in a right. while, you, you do. And so uh, that's it's just funny you say that. It was the same here with the with the size. Uh, but I will say, you know, they, they may have been smaller this year, um, but the frequency and the amount of different bears, because once you, you check that camera every day, you start figuring out which bear is which. Yeah. Um, the, the amount of bears and the consistency in which they were hitting the, the, the bait site was a lot more than last year. So last year we were getting bigger bears, but just not very frequent. And so... Yeah, I don't know. I kind of geek out on some of that kind of stuff. Like, what, what's the science behind it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I um, so Colby from Bear Hunter Magazine, he owns Bear Hunter Magazine. He came for the giveaway, and he lives in a state where you can bait. He lives in Arkansas, uh-huh. and through the magazine, he talks to tons of guides, and just he, he lives in the bear hunting world, right? So I learned a ton just riding around with Colby, and he was teaching me, like, I'm like, how easy is it to bait? Because I know guys like like kind of what you're saying like that struggle to kill a good bear over bait some years and it's just like like he's like dude it's it's really it's not as hard or it's not as easy as you'd think it would be he's like um like if you have a big bear coming in before season it'll probably be gone when season gets here or he had like time frames and he'd be a great guy for you to have on the show dude he is a wealth of knowledge like, oh i'd love to i if, learned if he gets yeah. excited about bears i'd love to have him on Dude, he he lives and breathes bear. He's trying. Um, if I could have found him a, a good bear, because he brought he he came and you know he had a tag and and um we just couldn't find him a bear. Um, we just we had a really hard time finding a bear. So I think we only saw seven or eight bears when we had him mm-hmm. um here, and and it was just you know that's half as many as we should have seen. But so he was supposed to kill a bear here, but he I think he's going to try and kill five more. Uh, before the end of the year or something wow, like that. Man, that's so, fantastic. Yeah, the, the, it, yeah, you you would love talking to him. He's got a great spirit and uh, just a wealth of knowledge, like science and biology. Mm. Like he's got it all figured out. So well, and I second I second what he says, man. I think that people have this perception that when you're baiting bears, it's like you know going back east or to Texas or something where where they've got those you know those big electric feeders for deer. And they uh-huh. they make that sound that's like doof, 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 doof. And, uh, and and as soon as that sound kicks on, all the deer come running into the field. To eat. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. You know, it's it's not like that. Uh, the bears, they not only are they, I I feel like they're the most keen animal outside of a wolf that I've ever pursued. Uh, mm-hmm. They have a very they have a very keen sense as to what their surroundings are and what's going on within their surroundings. Like I I, I was having this one bear that was coming into the bait like clockwork between 9 and like 9.20 a.m., right? Mm-hmm. So I told my daughter, I'm like, you know, that's a good bear. Why don't why don't we hit this thing tomorrow? Well, let's get here at 8.30. And, you know, it's tough to get back to this this area, so it, it takes some time. Um, 
we got there we got there at eight thirty, and that bear never showed up. And so we didn't go the next morning, and that bear was there between nine and nine twenty. These bears know when you're there, like they, they know when you're there. And so it's just not. I don't know what the magic is, but it it, it is there is this different element where. Um, Anybody that has this perception that bear, baiting bears is is an easy way to get a bear, uh, take it from me, man. I've it's just it's just not. <laughs> but I, you know, I, and it's funny you say that because when I when I hunt bears, it just seems like they have this weird weird luck. It's just like, how did you get it's lucky? A sixth sense they have. It's something. Something's yeah. there because I'll make a stalk and I'm like, this bear is so freaking dead. Like. It's going to, yeah, I'm going to get a shot at this bear. And then like the bear I shot at this year, um, <clears throat> turns out I had a little bit of a, a scope, um, problem, but, um, I had a bear dead to rights. I spotted him at six, fifth, six, 70, 670 yards. Good boar. One, probably would have been one of my best boars. And, um, so I'm like, dude, we like, I can make that shot. I got my, I got my long gun with me, but I, I know I can get to 225 and shoot him. And that's the responsible play. So we did that. We get there and he's gone. And I'm like, where the hell did he go? So I'm like the only thing that could have happened is that he, maybe he winded us, even though the wind should have been good the whole time. I'm like, you know, it's a bear, you know, he, he oh, could have yeah. winded you. Yeah. <clears throat> so we drive around, we come back a half an hour later, right before dark. He's at the exact same spot. He was when I spotted him. I'm like, that cocksucker never left. <laughs> I was like, he just where behind did he bush, go? man. <laughs> yeah, it, he was he was something, and it looked like the train was pretty flat. And when I walked it, it was it, there wasn't very many nooks and crannies he could have hid in. I'm wow. thinking he hid behind. I'm thinking he hid behind a stump or a log, and just he got lucky because he's like maybe he just took a little bit of a nap or or something. But anyways, I ended up shooting, and I grazed. I grazed right over. I'll send you the video and. And you can see him run off and everything, but um, oh, awesome. I ended yeah, up love shooting to see that, at man. him at six. Yeah, I ended up shooting at him at six seventy, and and that's how I figured out I was having um, gun, I call him gun herpes because it seemed like that about that same time I was having problems with another gun of mine. But so yeah, I had like a, an, a little bit of an issue with my rifle, and I just figured it out yesterday that the scope bases were um, getting looser and looser the more I shot it. So that's why my groups were very inconsistent. And oh yeah, I, that'll happen. Man. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, you should always work on your own shit because I, I took it to a friend and, and he didn't use Loctite when he did it. So, um, oh, gotcha. that's, yeah. that's my fault for not doing it myself. But anyways, yeah. So it's just like, there's like this weird aura or protection they have. I, I know I sound like fringe, but like, if you hunt bears enough, I'm like, someone's probably shaking their head, you know, listening to this podcast. I'm like, they they know what I'm talking about. So. I know they, they saw a video <laughs> of a bear in a dumpster and they think bear hunting's easy. So but, but they don't, they right. don't understand. Like, I, I know it's, I don't think it's like, what did you call it? What would you refer like fringe? I don't think it's like, fringe. It's like a, it's, I, I just, they, these bears, they know when something's up, man. They just, they mm-hmm. have a, they, they're not, they, I, I guess, let me put it this way. I hunt, I hunt all sorts of different species and nothing is as keyed in to the, their surroundings as bears are. They just freaking mm-hmm. know. And I don't know how, I don't know. Uh, you know, that the wind is one thing. And, and I, I know that obviously there, there's no fool in a bear's nose, no, no matter what you do. I saw these dudes right. as we're, me and my daughters were heading up, uh, to our, our spot where we hike in to our bait site, you know, and <laughs> these guys are getting out of their truck and, and they're like spraying themselves down with that dead downwind shit or whatever, oh, uh, you know, and yeah. it's like, ah. waste of money. Yeah, that is like you're not going to fool a white tail, let alone a freaking black bear. Um, yeah, and so I just I don't know what it is, man, but they are just keyed into their surroundings, and they just know when you're there. It's it's the craziest thing. I love it. That's that's what makes them so fun, though. Yeah, I and the, I want to hunt over. I've never hunted over bait. I was talking to Colby when he was here, and, and we were like kicking around the idea of going on a hunt together in like Canada or BC or something. I just wanted to sit and watch bears and, and then maybe shoot one. And I'm like, man, that would be so fun. Cause I, they're my favorite animal just to watch and observe. Like each one has their own personality. They do cool stuff. They use their hands. They, they, you know, they just, there's just so many dynamics to a bear that you never know what you're going to see, especially if they have cubs. And it's like, Oh, yeah. oh the ones with cubs are my favorite ones to watch. Like I've got videos. Like I literally laughed so hard because this this mama bear was just eating and this cub was just raising hell and and she ended up just literally swatting him on the ass like just mm-hmm. a big spanking and rolled his ass down the hill like you know 10 yards and he came back and he was just like 
the dynamic between the bear and the in the you know the bears this is like that's just so cool you don't get that with elk you don't get that with with deer um no, i just don't. love bear hunting man they're just they're just they've got their own little personalities and they're uh-huh. um, they're just an incredible animal dude i've got i've got one uh i get these uh it's called a scent ball from beat 907 and yeah, uh-huh. it's, yep. it's connected it's like this big waxy smelly thing and it's like the, it's shaped like a bell um and and it's it's attached to a rope and you run it up a branch and the bears go nuts over this damn thing and hmm. I've got this one. I've got. I'll send you this picture. This. And, uh, I, I've posted it a couple times. But this little black bear. He pulls it down, and he's. It, it looks like he's trying it on, like it's a hat. And, oh. <laughs> and they just the watching them trying to get to it. You know, if you you get a bear on the bait when when you're there, and it's like maybe one not not the caliber you're looking for. Or, or it's a sow with cubs. It's a great opportunity to just watch and learn these animals, mm-hmm. and and that's what like what you were saying. Just the entertainment factor out of them. You don't get that with elk. You don't get that with deer. There's there's just I mean they're just they're almost like when I see when I see the cubs, man. I I, I mean I probably I probably shouldn't say it, but I like the thought rolls through my mind. I'm gonna go snatch one of those cubs up and take it <laughs> home because it, it looks like my dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're so funny. So yeah. Anyway. Well, I, I mean, speaking of elk, what, what's your plans this year, man? So, um, general season mafia. So I'll be hunting the coast with the best of them. And, and um, I got um, a, a couple bulls picked out, but I haven't figured out how to predict where they go when they, after they uh, shed their velvet. So if he's on public and I can hunt him, you know, hell yeah. If I can't, we'll, we'll go find some other ones, but um, I'm really excited about this year. Cause, um, my dad who taught me how to like deer hunt and stuff, and he was never much of a, of a great elk hunter. He always just was a deer hunter, um, which he learned from his dad. And, um, so I struggled, you know, you, I think you probably know my story. I struggled growing up learning how to elk hunt oh, yeah. kind of on my own. And, yeah, me and you, that's, and why you, that's why we get along, man. <laughs> so, well, now, I, now I've got it pretty, pretty dialed in here, um, where I live and, and he hasn't bow hunted and he's never killed, uh, he hasn't bow hunted in over probably 15 years, I think. And he, um, when I was literally starting off bow hunting, he would like try and and help me as much as he could. And, um, you know, so I'm, I I get to pay him back for, for all the mentoring and taking me out. And I kind of want to help him. I want to help him get his first bowl with a bow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Yeah. I, I, I'm super stoked to to watch him stick his first bowl. I mean, he's killed bulls with a muzzleloader. He's a good muzzleloader hunter, but um with yeah. a bow he's he's just really struggled he has a really bad pass with a bow he's got some really bad breaks um killed some deer with a bow but never an elk and just uh could never get over that hump you know so i just want to you know pay him back for all the mentoring and stuff he did for me when i was a kid but you um know, that... killing, killing that big bull i'll send you a video of that big bull um he, yeah. he's pretty special yeah i'd love to see that man um i i'm curious about i want to talk about that for a minute the the struggle that that it was for you because when i say you know this is why we get along is because we we were both we both kind of had that upbringing from a sense that like i i was not taught the appropriate way to hunt elk i i was it was like you know here's how you hunt a deer oh and by the way uh this is how you hunt everything apparently according to us you know you just go <laughs> hunt elk and bears and everything like like you hunt a deer and it's just not the case you know and so right one of the things that um I, I really like about you is is uh, we kind of we we had that same t- type of thing, but you've been much more successful at teaching yourself how to be uh, an efficient uh, and effective elk hunter. And and I I want to talk about like what do you feel like when you when you started elk hunting? What do you feel like you didn't know that you've learned since that could cut a, a huge learning curve off of somebody else that was maybe you know, let's say they're 20 years old, their parents yeah. or, or their mentor didn't know shit about elk hunting. They've been, they've been led astray and mm-hmm. we're going to try to, we're going to try to rein this guy back in and, and get him set on the right path. What, what pops into your mind? Um, there's no easy way. You, you, you have to take the hard way. And, and what I mean by that is you, you, you can go out and get lucky. Um, and some people say, I'd rather be lucky than good. Well, lucky isn't duplicatable. Being good is. Yeah, and exactly you know, like it's hard to duplicate luck. Right. So I, 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 when I was starting off, I tried getting it done the easy way. Like I just, you know, I'd go, I'd drive, I'd walk over the edge and I'd bugle. And then if they didn't come in or I didn't hear them, I'd move on to the next spot. And, 
And I was always walking on eggshells. I was hunting deer, right? Like I was trying to sneak into the herd. I was trying to, this might be the only chance I get all year. I better not blow this one opportunity, you know? And, and so I was way too cautious. Um, I was trying to, I wasn't scouting. I wasn't putting boots on the ground. I wasn't spending a bunch of time in, with the wood, in the woods with elk um, prior to season. I wasn't putting in the work. I was trying to get easy, lucky success. And yeah. so if, if I was, if I was going to tell somebody something and they're like, well, I am hitting the, I am hitting the woods hard and I am doing this. I'm like, okay, well, what's your preseason work ethic look like? What are you, what are you doing preseason? Because, um, with Rosie's anyways, um, you're going to have a really good success. If you figure out a herd, um, they, they can be, they're very, very consistent over here. Um, so I have a cam on a wallow that I, I know if they hit that wallow, I know where they're going to be. Um, and if they haven't hit that wallow in a couple of days, I know where they are. So it's, it's kind of just a, a circle I can do, um, to get a hold of this herd. And in the last two years, that herd's had a really good bowl with it. So, um, that, that comes with getting boots on the ground that comes with a work ethic and you have to want it more than you want to go watch a movie or go watch TV or go be lazy or go do something else. Right. So yeah, yeah. I would say, get your priorities in check, quit looking for the easy success and just go figure it out. Go put boots on the ground. And one of the best podcasts I've ever heard, um, was gritty's, um, old elk nuggets back when he had, uh, he had, I think, Corey Jacobson. He had um, Jason Phelps on one. He had the Angry Spike guys on his podcast. This is many years ago, but it's still on YouTube. I, those are the best two episodes. Um, I tried to duplicate those um, this year with uh, Bro and Angry Spike on the same podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but he did a phenomenal job of capturing from those guys how to kill elk and put elk on the ground. Yeah. And um, those were the best two episodes i've ever heard on elk hunting um on how to get it done i've never seen so I, or i've never listened to those ones i'll have to check that out man ph- phenomenal those are the ones that everybody is now regurgitating all the information that is the og episodes in my opinion especially the angry spike guys for killing rosies that's the number one episode i've ever heard but um and we're talking i don't know six seven eight years ago i mean we're, we're going pretty far back now um yeah, I mean, but if you went back and listened to those episodes they're on youtube um on Grady's channel find them i think it's like elk nuggets or something like that and there's multiple of them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so yeah but, i'd love to check yeah. that out i i it's it because you know especially like in your when you're talking about the lifespan of of podcasting that's like ancient history eight or eight or nine years ago you know <laughs> right. but uh there's there's a lot of good information out there there's even i i wish i could remember the name of this i read this book uh, that was written by this old timer back in like 1979 or something like that and this is before everybody was out blowing on bugles and, you know, uh, the, it's, I mean, people did it, uh, but it, it wasn't like this big thing that it is now. And, and this book, mm-hmm. you would think, you would think that like, you know how things like I'm, I'm in the business world, right? So I'll, I'll pick up, I, I like to read business books. I like to read sales and marketing type books. I like to read anything, you know, entre, uh, p- did I even say that right, dude? Uh, you know, I, I like to close read them, enough. Uh, close enough. People know what I'm what I'm talking about here, but I like to read those type of books. But I'm always cautious because I'll I'll pick up some book, and it'll be talking about like CD ROM or something. You know, something <laughs> way outdated. And so, yeah, it's not like that with elk hunting. It's there's there's things that have changed. Like you know, we have better boots and better calls and better packs and and all this kind of stuff. But the the one thing that hasn't changed, it's not like reading a business book. Uh, it is just the, the, the nature of elk themselves, their behavior, uh, the right. way, and, and this is what, what, what the problem was for me growing up when, you know, we treated every game species like it was a mule deer and that's how we hunted it. Uh, mm-hmm. it it's also why we didn't notch tags. And, and I didn't know any better going well into my twenties, man. I, I didn't know. I just thought I was one unlucky son of a bitch. And, and I was like, how am I so good at deer hunting and I suck so bad at elk hunting? And I, I you know, this yeah. is before YouTube and podcasts and social media, even there, they're like, we didn't have, I, I think right. like MySpace was out or some shit. And, mm-hmm. and so this is back in the day where I just didn't know what I was doing wrong. And I'd hear these blowhards at work or, or through some friends at the bar or whatever. 
they'd be like, oh, well, this is how you elk hunt. Let me tell you, man, I'm, I'm like the world's best elk hunter. Here's what, what I do. And this is why, you know, I saw an elk over there and I saw an elk over there. Yeah. It's like, okay, but how many elk have you actually killed? Like, why are you talking to me like that? You, you don't know mm-hmm. any more than I do. The, the, the problem you have is you think you do. And this was the problem. This is, this is how information was like transferred back in the day. And, and so, um, where the hell was I going with this dude? I, I feel like I've been saying that a lot on the podcast. Like, <laughs> like, I'll get down some rant and I'll forget what the point of the whole conversation was. But I, I, but just, I think you're going where elk, elk haven't really changed much. The information is still applicable, you know, from, oh, yeah, from yeah, yeah. eight years ago, 10 years ago. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, even 30, 40 years ago, the, the, the application of, of elk behavior is, is still the exact same thing. And, uh, just, you know, for those that, that were taught wrong, um, you know, under understanding the elk behavior and like, like, uh, Garrett said, the looking for a shortcut is going to get you a shortcut to an unnotched tag, uh, looking for that easy button, looking for that cheat code. Uh, they just, man, I, I've been, I've been lucky a few times with deer. But I have never been lucky with elk. I'm like elk are a struggle for me. Every every square inch of success I've had in the elk woods has been because of hard work. Literally hard work and right. just my own dumb, you know, uh, I I don't know refusal to give up has has what's gotten me there. And so, yeah, there's just so much to it though. Well, you, what, listen, you talk, reminded me of a situation, and I'm not saying this to toot my own horn. Um, it's just a funny, it, it ties right into what you're saying here. So I had a bull. Um, I ended up shooting a bull, and I, I, my arrow deflected on a limb. I never even saw it. Um, and um, so I thought about punching my tag. I'm like, no, I took a good, responsible shot. I just didn't see a limb. So that's, that's not, that's not a, a situation for me. And I don't even know if the bull died or not. I mean, I searched for it for two days, never found a drop of blood, but I found half my arrow with, with some elk um, hide on it. So I kept hunting, long story short. Mm-hmm. Um, some people say you should have punched your tag. Well, I, I would punch my tag um, if I know I killed it, I, I, if I believe I killed it, or if I took a really stupid, irresponsible shot, that would be my way of basically punishing myself or checking yeah, and, myself and you know? the fishing game agencies man they they account for some of that kind of loss it's they do like, it's not like you're they do. you know ruining the elk population because maybe you kept hunting because honestly if you killed it you most likely would have known yeah. and i've i've been in both situations where i've hit an elk i know i killed it so i did notch my tag and i've been in other situations where i know i hit the elk but i don't know if i killed it so i kept hunting so that like yep i feel like Same some here. people get overly defensive about that yeah, so I, I kind of wanted to preface that, like I punched yeah, yeah. tags before when I when I you know had didn't have shit go my way, but so I um I didn't see an elk for twelve days straight after that, like the elk gods were punishing me, and I was like, God dang it, like I'm not going to fill my freaking tag, and so I'm uh, on the twelfth day, I'm up on the spot and I'm glassing, and I see um I got like my you know my 10 by fifties or whatever, my big vortex binoculars. And I'm glassing. Oh, there's a herd over there. I'm like, that one kind of looks like a bull. This bull's way the hell away. And I'm like, if that's a bull, that's a stud. So I grab my spot and scope. I'm like, Oh, that's a good bull. And I hauled ass around and I started, um, I ended up killing the bull, but the, the, the story where it ties into what you were saying is I played, uh, I played it on Instagram live. I, I did an Instagram live feed of it. Oh, really? And so, yeah. So people thought you can still, it's still on my Instagram. You can go watch it. Um, I freak out like a little after a little, like a little girl after I stuck the bowl. But um, no, so, uh, so what was really interesting for me is like, how lucky did you have to get? And this is where luck is, is meets being versus, and like I said, it sounds like I'm shooting my own horn here, but there's, there's something I'm trying to get to. Um, it was incredible how many people on Instagram live were giving me the shittiest advice you could possibly get. Really? Um, yeah, it was, it was 10 to one. Um, I, you know, I was inside, I was right at 80 yards. Um, I had no more cover. I could not sneak any closer. He had about 50, or I forgot how many cows he had. He had cows. I forget how many. Um, and there was, there's no getting closer to this bull. He's either going to have to, um, stand broadside at 80 and I was going to have to smoke him there, or he's going to have to, something would have to and Plus the wind would have to stay good. And it did for an hour. I think it was over an hour. I sat within 80 yards of that bull 
And everybody was like, bugle, call, do this, do this, do this. I'm like, that's really shitty advice. But um, so my, my, <laughs> I can't believe my, you're hunting elk somewhere where you could be on Instagram live. That's like unheard of. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I, um, I posted it the day after I smoked him and I, I, I pretended oh, like I gotcha. didn't tell anybody that it was, I just wanted to see what advice I would get. So mm-hmm. I played it like it was live. Right. And so the bull's dead, but, um, people were telling me bugle, 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 do this, call do this. And I'm like, this is the shittiest advice somebody could give somebody to scare that herd off. Like, yeah. um, like we all know, like if you're out in the middle of the open, it's a, it's a pretty new unit. I, I did a good job of getting as close as I could, which was 80 yards. And if I would have bugled, the herd would have looked over, not seen anything. And then a hauled ass, yep. like they would have taken off. It's, you know, for somebody that's hunted elk for a while, it's pretty common sense. Right. Yep. Um, but it was 10 to one bad information. So the people that are looking from the outside in, Garrett was so goddamn lucky to find a big bull in a unit that stood around for, you know, an hour to, to present him a shot. I'm like, okay, yes, I was lucky to find that bull, but there was knowledge involved in killing it. Because if I would have just been one of these nine out of 10 guys that called or bugled or whatever, um, that bull would still be alive today. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, so, um, kind of like what you were saying, like knowledge and, and just getting lucky, but it's just, it kind of all tied in together. Like I realized how, how many people did not know what they were talking about, um, on Instagram live. And it was just like, holy shit. Like there's a reason podcasts play such a huge role because those people, I guarantee you, some of them listen to my podcast and, but they just didn't retain that piece of information. Like, no, you don't call to a fucking elk in the middle of the open and unless it's like the last resort, like, I don't know why you would ever do that. I think that's just, but, the, I, I think that's just, it's like the epitome of social media in general, man. It's where people can go and make, make themselves feel good about sounding like an expert when they're really not, you mm-hmm. know, it, it's the same thing, you know, the, uh, b- back in the day before social media, you know, you, you, I'm old enough to, to remember going to work before we had social media and, and we had, you know, we always had the coffee club, the coffee cup club, you know, the, mm-hmm. the big mouth, uh, dorks that stand around all day and drink coffee and don't actually get any work done, but they got the biggest opinions, you know, and they, and they got the mm-hmm. loudest voices. And it's, it's interesting. I don't think people can connect like historically in the, in the, in the story of human, um, uh, in, in, the story of mankind or, or humanity or whatever, how bad that has fucked shit up for people. There's a lot of great trail cameras out there. I've run the Tacticams, and that's a great system, especially their cell cameras. I've run a lot of different brands that I've, I've recommended to you guys in the past, but the right fit at the right time is the Spy Point trail cameras. I have uh, a couple of the Flex G36s that are cell cams. They do a really good job for keeping track of everything that's going on on my property. And I also have for, you know, kind of out in the back country, I've got these Force Pros. Man, the picture quality on those Force Pros is is just amazing. If you guys saw some of the bear pictures I was showing you during Spring Bear, that was a Force Pro. Really great cameras. I, I'm really excited that they are, uh, they chose to sponsor the show because I've been, I've been been using spy point for a long time and and i think you guys are going to be just as happy as i am with them and check them out at spypoint.com and let them know the western huntsman sent you some of you might be old enough to remember back in the day when you can go to walmart and get you a savage rifle for very cheap and they did a good job but they weren't like equipped for some of the hardcore hunting out there that we do today if that's a memory that you have with savage like i do I'm telling you, it's not like that anymore. Savage Arms is one of the premier firearms manufacturers dedicated to us hunters. I have this freaking uh, Savage 110. It's the Apex Hunter. And this thing is amazing. I love the AccuTrigger. You can also get them with the AccuFit, which allows you to adjust the stock. So if you're buying them for youth hunters or whatever, or just, you know, rifles fit you different. It's so flexible. It's so perfect for every hunter. It's just not the same Savage that it was 30, 40 years ago. It's a great firearm for everyday use while hunting, and they support hunters and they support this show, and I really appreciate Savage Arms. Check them out anywhere firearms are sold or go to savagearms.com to find out more. 
in, in the past. <laughs> like I, the, some some really relevant examples come to me in the Civil War. What that you know in the in the eighteen sixties we we break out in this big civil war, and these really um, non blowhard, very humbled kind of generals go to the Virginia Theater and fight for the Confederacy, right? And mm-hmm. and then you get these loudmouth pompous blowhard fat motherfuckers that are sent up to the north and and who's who's getting their asses whooped it's these jews like like general after general lincoln's putting in charge of the union army right and every time he puts a new guy in in charge he's like oh well general lee better watch his ass because i'm gonna whoop his ass all over the place and (laughs) uh, and uh, may god have mercy on general lee for i will not and and my uh my office is in my saddle we're gonna we're gonna route general lee here uh, with short notice or what you know they talked funny back then they had actually they had excellent command of the english language back then but uh (laughs) it wasn't until this real quiet guy covered in mud shows up in washington dc named general grant Mm-hmm. He's got none the big staff. He's got none the big mouth. He's got none the big blowhard and none the ego. Goes down there and finally ends the war, right? And it's the same. Right. If you if you understand just the human nature element of the whole thing, it's the same kind of thing, man. These dudes on I see terrible advice on on Facebook and Instagram and places where where somebody will will hey man, I'm uh, looking for a new bugle, and and you'll get you'll get these people that are like. Oh, this this bugle's great, or or don't bugle at all. The elk hate bugles, or only cow call, or never bugle at all. And here's the thing that people should really pay attention to: is there are dudes that are way more successful at me that bugle way more than me. There are dudes that are way more successful than me that don't even carry a call into the woods. Yep. There's dudes that are way more successful than me that only carry cow calls, and and they're yep. all better than me in that element and 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 it's it's that's what they want to pursue and so some dude screaming and yelling about how bugling is bad is wrong and th- vice versa the dude saying that you shouldn't bugle at all or or no maybe what whatever the opposite of the first thing i just said there uh, <laughs> right. telling you to bugle more you know they're they're all right and they're all wrong in their own way and and that's where you really have to learn how to weed through some of this information that you get online because it's like 99 like you said Nine times out of ten, it's coming from a place out of no experience and complete blowhard foolishness where people just want to feel this like sense of self-importance as if they fucking know anything. And that's where it's coming from, and it leads a lot of people astray, including me. When I grew up, I, I was told never to bugle because it scares the bulls away, and all you should do, and, and, and I'm not, like in your situation where you were just describing you're out in the open i agree i wouldn't have bugled either but but that doesn't mean i don't ever bugle right right and and uh anyway this you could tell i get pretty fired up about this stuff i get (laughs) i get really irritated man when people just start throwing around wisdom that's not actually wisdom especially on social media because they can get away with it like nobody knows how experienced that guy is you know what i mean a hundred percent and there's a lot you know it, one thing that's kind of turned me off in the last year is, is just a lot of these. Um, I have never in my life said anything. I've never c- like claimed that I'm a guru, claimed that I'm an expert. Like if I have a special area is the way that I describe it. It'd be like arrow building. Like that it would be my specialty. But that's I'm not an expert. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I just, you know, like I'm just a, I'm just into it more than the average person. Right. And that's the way that I look at it. But I built. I, I don't know how many hundreds, thousands. I don't know how many hours I've spent shooting arrow. Like I, I've shot, I've shot more arrows in one year than most people shoot in their lifetime. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's insane. And then you through are all those obsessive arrows, <laughs> with that. Yeah. Story, I, I, I have a kind it. of an obsessive yeah, personality. So like that year I shot, uh, I, I'm paying for it now. I'll pay for it the rest of my life. I um, screwed both my shoulders up shooting um, uh, uh, too many arrows one year, but um I think I shot like, uh, cause I tracked it and I, <laughs> you want to talk obsessive. I tracked it. I measured my groups. Um, I tracked how many arrows I shot. I tracked how many arrows I could shoot before my group started to open up from all the way out to zero or 10 to hundred. Like I was so deep into the weeds Dude, that you, I'd shot you, over 18. Huh? Go ahead. What did you do? Have like a little tick sheet. So every time you shot your bow, you'd just make a little mark or something. 
Yeah, no, I had like a, I made an Excel spreadsheet. I print it off and then I just like save it. And then I would like Whoa. compare that to like a month later. Like, so I could see how good I'm getting. And if I was better at 50 yards than I was 60 yards, Dude, or if wait. I was better at 70 yards than I was 40 yards, why am I better at 70 yards than I am 40 yards? Is it the pin? Is it need to, like, what, if, what am I doing? Like, it's just, Am I getting into the peep different? Am I, there's so many things. Wow. You are um, super, man. I like you, but we are not the same. You, like that, <laughs> that is like, that is super, uh, getting into the technique, technicality of, of, uh, you know, analysis. Uh, and, and actually I, I kind uh, yeah. of, I'm kind of envious, you know, some people have that type of personality where, where that's what bodes well for them and, and is satisfied. Right. You know, there's a satisfaction you get out of, of, uh, you know, tracking down these technical details like that. I kind of did that yeah. uh, when I, you know, when it came to trout fishing and, and a sp- specifically fly fishing for for a long well, time, but not to that extent. Like you actually made an Excel spreadsheet and tracked each fucking shot, man. That is impressive. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd shoot uh, groups of six. I'd shoot about three to four hours every day. I would shoot about two. I, I got to the point where after about 200, 200, like was it 200 to 220 arrows? That's when my groups would really start to open up. Uh-huh. So I'd, I'd, I'd quit. Sh- I'd shoot 200 arrows a day minimum. Wow. Um, cause I was, tr- I was training for, for something I was doing and, mm-hmm. and, um, <clears throat> but let me wrap this, let me put a bow on this for you real quick. So <laughs> I'd shot over 18,000 arrows between the end of January, which is the year I got my hail on six at the end of January from to the beginning of, um, August, I'd shot 18,000 arrows and, um, it learned a shit ton, um, through the wow. 18,000 arrows. But, um, where I'm getting with that is I was not as much of a killer as I am now. I wasn't feeling my elk tag back then. I wasn't even getting close to elk. I wasn't, I wasn't killing half as much shit as I am today. When I switched and turned the corner and said that that's great and all, but wouldn't those hours be better spent? Like, like the conversation you and I had last time, woodsmanship, getting out in the woods, putting boots on the ground, learning about Mm -hmm. the animals, finding out where they go when they get pushed, you know, like learning how to call, learn like, woodsmanship building like all that time could have been spent into woodsmanship and i would have cut my learning curve and my failure uh in half like i would have killed the bull probably my second or third or fourth year instead of waiting six years to kill a bull like mm-hmm. like i i all that shit all that resources and all that time researching foc arrow building you know all this other just shit that really doesn't matter um could be spent helping you actually succeed if you can't get an animal in front of you it doesn't matter whether you have nine percent foc or a 30 percent foc because you're not going to get a chance to find out right like it doesn't matter you yeah. have to get an animal yeah. in front of you well so i i got a question for you sure uh, when you when you went through and you fired off eighteen thousand arrows in what eight months <laughs> uh what? i, I don't, yeah, between January and August, so whatever that is, yeah. Well, August is the eighth month of the year, so that's that's why I... I, I yeah, it's basically, like, if I remember right, it's January 24th or 25th, so oh, it's basically February. Yeah, so like seven months. Yeah. <clears throat> so, were you using, like, or, first of all, were you using the same bow? Yeah, it was a Halon 6. I had shot it so much that I had worn through the finish on the on the handle on the riser. Well, so it, was, it turned, it turned white, um, like anywhere <laughs> my hand was, was gripping like the camo <laughs> That's pattern. It was, oh man, that is yeah. funny actually. So wh- what about, what about your arrows? Were you, were you like tracking different arrow setups while you were doing this or were you like shooting the same arrow setup <laughs> every single time throughout this whole process? So yes and no. I, I, so this, I, I think I've told you this before, but this is back when I was trying to break the world record for the well, world's longest, most accurate bow shot. So, oh, okay. Um, so that's why I was shooting so many arrows. So yeah, I tried a bunch of different arrow configurations, different FOCs, um, you know, vein configurations, everything, uh, arrow types, arrow diameters. So um, Wayne from the bow rack ended up uh, building the <clears throat> ones that I ended up using on my official attempt. They were a double inserted um, uh, injection with a pretty high FOC really, but I ended up going down a little bit of tip weight because it's kind of giving me a parachuting effect. Um, we were shooting 330 yards. Wow. Um, I think 300, shit. yeah, 300, yeah, 305 yards was the record. Um, and it still is, uh, Matt Stutzman has it and I'm glad I didn't break it because it's a funny story, but I'm glad I didn't break it. The guy that has the record needs to keep the record. So, yeah. um, yeah, cool, man. <clears throat> long story short, 
Huh. But yeah, so I was shooting all sorts of different things. It was, it wasn't actually for, it was benefited my hunting because I was, you know, if I aimed at something, it was going to die, but, um, it didn't matter. Like I was hitting, you know, a true can at, um, 80 yards. I was hitting a true can about, oh, I'd shoot five or six arrows and I'd, I'd have three or four in the true can almost every group. And then if my, my other, my arrow that wasn't in the true can might be like two or three inches outside. So it was like super tight yeah, groups. Yeah. Yeah. The two can is three inches. So <clears throat> what do you think? What do you think, man? Like with, with all the, the drama that, that comes with archery sometimes, uh, with, with opinions mm-hmm. and, and, you know, these, these new technologies that come out that everybody gets like, you know, psycho about for whatever amount of time until it kind of wears off and the next big thing comes out. And, well, fads. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like these fads. What, what do you think is, something that people spend way too much worrying about and fussing about that really when it comes down to putting an animal on the ground is just not that relevant. Is there something like that? You're, you're, you're baiting me here. (laughs) I might be, I don't know. I, I probably, you're, you're going to get me on a soapbox here really quick. So uh, (laughs) I, I I've gone down this. Yeah, dude, I've, I've gone down this and if I hear anybody talk about FOC anymore, I automatically think that they're not a killer. Because it's just like the biggest killers that I've talked to and the ones that I've interviewed on and off the off the record, like ones that like you don't have this conversation um, and you don't tell you don't use my name when you have this conversation kind of things because they don't want their name associated with the conversation. Um, interestingly enough, um, yeah. guys that have over a thousand bow kills to their name, right? like they're legitimately like you will never know. You would never know who they were. Um, they, they don't measure FOC. They say it's fucking retarded. Like, why would you spend your time doing that? Go out and learn the animal. That's where I really started to turn the corner is like, why is every killer I'm talking to guys that are absolute savages who fill almost every tag on public land, uh, you know, in Africa, wherever they go, they're, they're filling a tag kind of like, kind of like a Remy Warren, right? The guy, you drop the guy off in the middle of nowhere. He's going to fill a tag. Yeah. And, um, why are, why, why do none of these guys? care about their arrow setups like these internet trolls do like why why is that why do why do they not measure their foc why do they not have the same grain um tolerance that i keep myself to like because i used to have if i had a if i had an arrow that was the plus or minus over a grain i wouldn't use it in my quiver right like it's so over and, and above and beyond that's that's so overkill See, so, like some of the stuff you're saying dude i i like this is not being hyperbolic. I don't know what that means. I, I don't okay, know what that so, means. Yeah, so, so if I'm shooting the, what the tolerance, fuck? yeah. So if I have a 450 grain arrow, and I because I used to weigh every single, you know, every single component, I'd weigh every single everything, every single broadhead because broadheads aren't uniform. They they vary plus or minus, you know, three grains, five grains depending on the quality. So if I have a 450 grain arrow. And that was my setup. That's what I was going to shoot. And that's what I did for many years, 450 grains. Mm-hmm. If I had a 455 grain arrow, it wouldn't make it in the hunting quiver. If it was 452, it wouldn't make it in the hunting. It had to be 450, 451, or, or 449. Like, that was my tolerance that I set, set my arrows up to. Wow. And, um, yeah, like, I was so OCD about everything that I could control that – all that time I was spending doing that prevented me from being successful. That's what I'm, that's what I'm getting. Like all the shit that people are focusing on that. Yeah, it is important, but it's preventing them from being successful because they're honing in on the wrong shit. They yeah. just need to get out in the woods and go learn and fail and fail forward. Right. Like go out and, and yeah, you have learning curves that like you, I guarantee you speed up people's learning curves. I've helped speed up learning curves, all the podcasts, YouTube, videos all the all the articles that we that helps people speed up learning curves and make good decisions but it also leads them down a rabbit hole that prevents them from being successful because they're focusing on that shit way too much like they just need to go out and put boots on the ground and spend time with the animals like it's not it's it's shit that 30 years ago if i said that we're like well no shit dumbass like we didn't have podcasts we didn't have youtube we didn't have all this stuff like it would be common sense you, and a lot of these fads, uh, one, let me, I'll finish this and I'll let you ask that question. A lot of these fads that you see, these, these impact callers, these footers, guys were doing that 40 years ago before I was even born. So it's just shit that kind of gets regurgitated and rebranded to 
sound original, but they're copying something that somebody did 30, 40 years ago. Oh, that's a good point, man. I think I think you're right. It does. It just gets regurgitated. It's not new shit. It's just it's not. It's repackaged. It's rebranded. Hey, here's the next big thing. And you know, I know a lot of this stuff comes from within the hunting within any. In, I don't care what industry we're talking. I don't care for you know um, Al Bundy shoe salesman. There, there, there is a certain element of a lot of this stuff that is is pure marketing, and the marketing. I didn't lose you, did I? No, I'm still here. I, I'm like my. I, I was looking something up archery wise while you were talking. <laughs> my shit ass internet isn't pulling up, and then you went silent. You're good. So okay. you're good. A- anyway, there's there's always this element of marketing around all all of this shit, and I, I think that that's what happens is is just due to the nature of the marketing cycle. Now we we're, we're talking about FOC again, or we're talking about you know right. the spine of arrow versus this broadhead versus lighted knocks versus you know all these different things, and especially archery. Archery to me, to me, I, I brought up fly fishing earlier, and and don't even get me started on the fly fishing industry because I I like the ninety percent of the shit you see about fly fishing is total BS. It's it's is it really? oh it's BS, <laughs> man. And there's like this snobby culture yes. around fly fishing where these dudes <laughs> they they want to act like they're above and beyond what like somebody drowning in a night crawler is even capable of comprehending with their you know uh their tapered leader down to their you know certain size of the fly with the gray feather in the back of it as if a fucking fish is going to swim up to that <laughs> fly and be like oh man there wasn't a gray feather in that in that their fly like give me a break this stuff i i am the most basic dumb redneck fly fisherman you will ever meet and i outfish the dudes on the river that have like six thousand dollars worth of gear you know i haven't replaced my fly rod in 15 years and i still get sick of catching fish this is like i'm really good at it and so it drives me crazy that something i love has been so propagated by marketing and and that's how we've yeah. gotten this snobby I'm holier than now kind of kind of culture on the fly fi- fly fishing side. And which, by the way, I'm not above drowning a worm either. I, I like all types of fishing as long as I'm catching fish. I, yeah, I, I don't complain, man. I I just I find fly fishing to be the most proficient way to and an easiest way to catch fish on a river. So that's why I do it. And mm-hmm. and and I think that I I've always worried that 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 cultural side of uh that I was talking about that's kind of stuck up, that's kind of snotty, that's trying to, you know, be holier than thou because we're archery guys, that that culture, or I'm sorry, fly fishing guys, that that mentality is, I, I, I've i always been worried that's going to creep into the fly, uh, archery side of things. You know, like, you know, rifle hunters are, are like the the worm fishermen and, and archery hunters are like the fly fishermen kind of thing. And I've, I've always mm-hmm. kind of been worried about that because it, it's a big turnoff for me. And I know that... I was fly fishing before all this marketing really took hold of the fly fishing um, culture, if you will. Mm-hmm. And, and th- those were the good old days, man. And and I just like people weren't like that back then. People weren't like like snobby and 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 uh, like flat out rude in in the fly fishing space. Hundred percent. And like then all this marketing and all elitist, these elitist, purist, yeah, elitist, yeah. and and then within within fly fishing, you even have layers upon that. Like, oh, if you use a strike indicator because <laughs> you're fishing subsurface with a with an emerger, you are less than the pure mm-hmm. the purity of the dry fly fisherman. Yeah, you know, they, they get, it's yep. so ridiculous, dude. It's like fucking just go out and catch a fish and shut the fuck up. I, I yeah. don't understand the drama. Save the drama yeah. for your mama and f- fling some arrows and catch some fish. I just, I don't want to see that creep into the archery side. Sorry. I want to, well, it's it. already, it's, it's, it's crept in there. And by the way, those, those douchebags are the same ones that say they can tell the difference between a native and a hatchery. And I say, fuck you. No, you can't. I've caught enough steelhead and enough salmon that that what adipose fin that they cut off isn't helping that fish swim or fight any different. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. You always yeah. check the That's fish when you get it up to the boat to see if it's a hatchery. I don't care who you are. <laughs> you, you don't know until you see the fin. Like you mm-hmm. don't know like that when guys, Oh, you can tell it's a hatchery by the way. It's fine. I'm like, dude, fuck off. That drives me 
nuts. And we have a lot of peers <laughs> here locally. Like if that, that guy smells his own farts, that guy that says that, that guy's, yeah, he's, full he's of, not, he's full of shit. He's full, he's full of shit. He's full yeah. of shit. So, yeah. Totally. But that infighting, that infighting is alive and well, and it's been going on since probably Bo Hunt's been around. But um, you know, I just I feel like it was a lot, a lot more simpler before I was even around. Like when my dad just talking about XX seventy fives, which is an old aluminum um, arrow, and I'm oh, like, man, yeah, there's the shit was just more simple back then. Yeah, you know, shit was more simple back then. Like I kind of wish I was born thirty years prior, but um you know yeah I, I long know, story short i don't know about yeah. that but you're you're exactly right from the sense of the drama has been magnified there's always been drama and competition and rivalry amongst archery hunters and you know with fly fishermen i feel like i cut you off did i cut you off there dude no no you're fine no you're good go I, ahead i just like the the drama behind it has just been exas- exaggerated and and dramatized to a, a, a a more uglier extent than it used to be. You know, when I first started bow hunting, they, I, I people, people are going to like absolutely shit themselves <laughs> when they hear this. My quiver, I, I, I was starting to bow hunt when they were just like kind of coming out with the carbon arrow. Right. Um, I <laughs> went out hunting mule deer that had aluminum and carbon arrows. <laughs> you know, they were totally right. different arrows and they flew totally different either, but you kind of got this sense of where you you knew you knew uh you, you knew how the aluminum was going to fly in in comparison to the carbon arrow, right? You know, and so right. um right. you know, I, I but I would never do that today. But back then, I would have never disparaged or, or, you know, just been, like, mean to people on social media if it existed uh, about, about the fact that they mix those arrows. But even though right. now, nowadays I know that's a big no-no, I'd never do that, um, but it, it's just that people so – I, and I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is when I was corrected about that, he it was more like a, oh, man – you know what? You're making the same mistake I did when these carbon arrows came out. You, here's what you want to do, young man: uh, switch to either all aluminum or all carbon, and that way you're going to shoot a lot more consistently. <laughs> Where now, right. if somebody did that, it'd be like, "Yo, a bitch ass motherfucker! For cut, you don't you, you don't know shit what you're doing. You should you should yeah. be hunting. They ought to take you. They ought to hang you from a tree. Yeah, you know right. the, the difference in how nasty it gets." is 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 where i get concerned and where like where does that end what's the end game for all this um infighting and and the extent of which this infighting creates this hate and drama and uh discontent amongst hunters it it ends with us losing our rights it ends with you know the ban of hunting um with hounds it ends with you know it's it's going to be certain little little points of of interest that we're you know like we lost bear hunting um, I forget what measure it was, like measure seven or nine or something. I forget what it was. But in 1994, we lost the ability to hunt with with hounds in Oregon. Mm-hmm. And that's because all of the infighting, the hound hunters didn't like the other guys. And these guys didn't like those other guys. And I've done a full blown study into why we lost that. Like I I printed off documents and, and I, I like surveys like ODF and W, uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, even did a special study of like, how did this shit pass? Like this should not have passed. And it was incredible. Like how many people were, you know, new to Oregon that voted that had no idea that bears primary food wasn't fish. Like there was like (laughs) 5%. Yeah. Like it was in, it was an incredible study and it's like, okay, we lost because hunters weren't unified. That was the sole reason we lost. Yeah. There's a lot of really ignorant, stupid voters out there, just uneducated, like, city folks that don't who think you know our our black bears in oregon the only thing they eat is fish like that's what they see on tv right so that's why we lost that 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 point is because of infighting and you know that slow erosion of our right to be out in the woods and that slow erosion of our rights to go out and feed ourselves with the meat that we get from the woods that's completely organic and i i hate that word because it's a niche word now but it just, you know, yeah, it, it's true. It is, or it is organic meat, right? I mean, it's, it's not. There's nothing, no antibiotics in there. There's no nothing. It's so. like the, it's like the true definition of organic before it was like a buzzword, you know. Before BHA was around, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and <laughs> so, and everybody it's a joke with their, people with don't hang me. <laughs> all, the, all these, I have, I have in our neighborhood. They, we, everybody has like, you know, chickens and stuff, and it's like, oh, well, my chickens are organic, and I, what, what does that even mean? My chickens are like, right. they eat grasshoppers, dude. What's more organic than that? 
Exactly. Exactly. It's just th- it, this slow erosion is going to keep happening until we all get on the same page. Like the the elitists have to let go of their ego. You know, the guys that For use sure. strike indicators are going to have to vote the same way because we are losing hatcheries here in Oregon. We're losing the ability to manage our wildlife. We're going backwards on some of our herds. Dude, the and I, I, it's, no, it's insane. It's totally insane. And just like just the term strike indicator pisses me off. Yeah, you know what you know what strike indicator is? It's a fancy it's a term bubble. for a bobber. Like fucking really you had to come up with it. It's a bobber. Yeah. It's so you know yeah. if you, if you've got a if you've got a you know a wet fly under a subsurface fly and a, and, a, and a trout hits it, you know for sure there's a trout on the line. You don't need to Oh yeah. But you have to come up with a fancy name. Oh, it's not it, a bobber. It's frustrating. So we do it the same thing cuz me and my dad like to fly fish, but we do it with spinning rods and a fly bubble. And, um, so you can cast out your fly with a, with a spinning rod. That's and a great method, dude. Yeah. And, and, but the, but the elitists who use strike indicators, right. Don't think that that's fly fishing. So they should, we should outlaw the spinning rods and fly. That's something they've been trying to do for years. It's just like, dude, you use a fucking strike. You use a fancy bubble or a, a bobber. Like, like I, I'm on the same page. You are like elitist fly fishermen piss me off. So, oh, it, it drives me <laughs> crazy, just, man. I think I think we can all agree that at least fly fishermen are douchebags. <laughs> yeah, they are douchebags, and what I think I think why I'm I'm so further uh, offended by that that whole thing is uh, I'm very passionate about fly fishing. I love fly fishing, man. It is it's for me. It's just this. I love being on a river. I and I I love I love. Um, outsmarting the fish at their own game because you're 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 getting them with their natural food source right a worm is not a natural food source i mean it is but it's not like it's not often in the middle of uh a 200 a lake. foot lake yeah that's that's 200 feet deep there's gonna be this worm floating around you know <laughs> it's just not, not not a normal way they feed but that they're opportunists and so that's i think why i get like even more defensive about fly fishing is it really is a fun way to catch fish and, mm-hmm. and it would be a lot cheaper and easier for people um, to to get into it if, if it weren't for those elitists because they, they not only make it more expensive, but they also, they complicate it. They complicate it with their marketing and, and what fly works. And, and, and I just don't want to see that kind of drift into the hunting space and start bumping into archery. You know what I mean? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's spilled into archery so bad. I mean, it's already there. Like you could replace elitist fly fishermen with guys who are just uh, Ashby followers. Like, yeah. and you have the, you have the heavy FOC arrow builders versus the light and fast. And that's that they're just, there's never really going to be much middle ground because they're on such opposites. And I've wanted, since I've had my podcast, I, I, I will send this out through your, I'll send this out, invite out through your podcast. If I can get a light arrow advocate for light and fast, I will host a podcast where you can debate and I will moderate it versus a heavy arrow guy. I cannot find a light arrow guy that is willing to take that. Dude, you're like, always you're always kind of advocating to be the uh, the moderator. Yeah, didn't you want to you wanted to uh, debate me? I on, did. I wanted on, a guy to moderate it. I yeah, wanted. To oh, that's you right. Yeah, yeah. Project. Yeah, that's you and right. I, you and I. <laughs> I forgot about that. What, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to eat your lunch. <laughs> what was that topic? Though? It was um, it was hunting numbers or something like that, like um, hunter recruitment. That's what. Oh, it was. that's right. You we, you were you, you were against that, and I was for it. I was against. I was I was not on board with saying we need more hunters, and you were on board with like we need more hunters. And I'm like, okay, let's ex- let's debate this. Explain because <laughs> yourself. We got We got to have. We don't need to debate. You want to do this now? We we don't. It doesn't have okay. to be like a full on debate. But uh, let, okay. I I am super curious on uh, how you feel about this. Why my question? First question to you. Why do you want more hunters? Well, because Is it because of voting. No, uh, more more hunters means a it, it's it's the 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 age old that that business adage of of stakeholders. We need stakeholders. Uh, I don't care if they're active hunters like you and I, where we go out, we don't miss a season, man. What I what I think we need more of is the old fashioned American tradition where hunting is a normal part of being a human, and everybody's got an uncle or a cousin or a brother or an aunt or an uncle that hunts, and and hunting is normal. There's normalcy within the ranks spread across the southeast, the northeast, the you know Midwest, the the and and out here out west and the and the coastal, you know, like where you're at. Uh, and I just I think that there is a lack of normalcy 
amongst the populace because we've gotten this society where we we've got this normalcy around Uber Eats and delivered pizza. Mm-hmm. And and people hunting seem like these savage, uh, you know, irrelevant beasts of 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 the past that um, just like to go out and kill shit because they saw a video from PETA put out that on some redneck, right. you know, beating up a deer or something. And so that that uh, you know that's one of the reasons why I, I advocate for for people like Joe Rogan and Steve Ranella, you know, these big names out there to advocate for hunting because they create a normalcy in the humanity of hunting. Because it's right. a part of us, and I feel like we're losing that through this overly comfortable society, and and we've got a nation of fucking pussies. So where, where keep so I'm going to keep with you here. So where does that normalcy benefit us? Like where does that lead to normalizing the, hunting and nor, normalcy? So in your state, what is that? IB thirteen. Um. What what is oh, that? IP three. Is it what is the uh, real radical? Um, proposition that came out in Oregon where they were wanting to eradicate all killing of animal to include uh, meat production to uh, yeah. you know make it a crime to breed prized horses to uh, obviously yep. get rid of hunting get rid of trapping you basically any kind of killing of animal no matter what the human consumption aspect of it was they want Correct. that gone right yeah, so that was See? IP3. Okay. That was that bill I told you was like the biggest piece of shit bill I've ever seen in my life. It is. But. And I tr- I tried to get the uh the 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 OG of that bill on my show and he told me that I'd have to agree that hunting is bad for for him to agree to come on my show. Uh <laughs> so he's a pussy. And so the the yeah. the point to that is when you look at that bill I, IP3. Um is, yeah. is that is that what it is? IP3? Yeah. Yeah, IP3. Uh, so when you when you look at that do you think that in 1981, I'm just throwing out a year, mm-hmm. that would have even been suggested? I mean, I mean, it, that it, without the reaction of this guy is an absolute lunatic off his rocker, put him in a mental institution. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think it. I don't think in that climate at that at that time it would have. He would have been. He would have been ostracized. Like and, he and, would have been absolutely. Who's this nut job? And so, so the point to that is, is now we, we've, we live in a time where not only was that a proposition that was being seriously taken by a, a surprisingly large portion of the populace in the state of Oregon, it gained traction, like somewhere around 200,000 signatures. Right. And, and they all came from Portland. And oh, then, oh, yeah. And Eugene. Totally, <clears throat> totally Portland. And, and, and I understand that. But I guess what I'm driving at is... When you look at the climate of, the, uh, again, the, and it goes to a deeper point, man, and I, I don't want to bore people to death with a deeper point, but the, the, a summary of the deeper point is we have created a society where there's so much comfort. The, the, the quality of life is so high. We don't worry about competing tribes taking us out. We don't worry about nations conquering us and turning us into slaves we don't worry about where our next meal is going to come from we we don't we, we have an uber we can you know get drunk at the bar and get a ride home and 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 then that guy the next day can deliver del taco yeah you know there there's i'm not saying this is bad but it has created these big metropolitan areas in which folks have no connection with nature they have no connection with their food where it comes from where this meat is produced and so the thought of going out into the woods and getting dirty and tearing up your pants in the Oregon coast brush is this foreign thing. And because it's so foreign, the lack of these real hardships of when you look back through the history of humanity that people have faced, that doesn't exist. So they have to attach themselves to some kind of cause to fight, to feel good about themselves, to make them feel like they're struggling. And one mm-hmm. struggle is, oh, well, you shouldn't be a hunter because I'm not a hunter. And these poor animals, these poor bears are getting killed in Washington. We need to stop spring bear. We need to stop hound hunting. How mean is that to chase a mountain lion up a tree with a hound and, and have somebody, some savage redneck come up and shoot it? Now, all of a sudden, they have this, they have this cause to attach themselves to. And, and it's, it's, it's bred out of like almost this lack of self-importance and almost like this level of boredom. And so mm-hmm. as hunting numbers start to struggle and you'll, you'll have 
like entire families in in especially in these bigger cities that nobody in that family is a hunter nobody is and so mm-hmm. like they don't know a hunter they think that hunters only live in like crazy places like Clark Fork Idaho and and uh you, you know Reno Nevada these these no no name places well Reno's not that no name is it i lost a shitload of money there once <laughs> anyway you know, I think that that's why I look at hunter recruitment as as like this necessity, this this necessary evil to carry this on to create a larger amount of stakeholders to to bring us into the future to normalize hunting as a thing that humans do, and not allow it to fall by the wayside by these activists that think that we should eliminate all meat production in the state of Oregon. Right. So you and I agree on everything but one point we don't need more hunters we need and my point is we need more voters and that's basically i was trying to back you into a corner you did a good job and i'll let me do that so um <laughs> well, i was thanks, trying to man. trying to steer you into the voting corner yeah you know you did a good job um so my debate would be we don't need more hunters it seems like everywhere i go the woods are getting more and more and more and more crowded it's like okay crap well if can, our can hunter numbers are something about that though yeah go ahead I, and I, I want you to go right back to your point. I, I really, I, I hate when I feel like I cut people off, so I apologize about that. No, you're good. Do you think that the woods are getting more crowded with archery hunters? Because you're you're very much an archery guy, like I am, right? And and so like, or are the woods getting more crowded during rifle season and muzzleloader as well? And I'm asking out of a genuine curiosity because I I haven't noticed an increase in the rifle side, but archery, man, it is the woods I hunt. Uh, in comparison to five years ago, only five years ago is way different. What do you think? Yeah. So yes, yes. And yes. So I, I hunt archery, I hunt rifle and my family also hunts muzzleloader and across the board it's going up. And so I think archery is kind of ticking up quick. Um, you know, thanks to Joe Rogan and you know, all that, all that cool crowd and stuff and, you know, Steve Rinella. But, um, I, I think that, yeah, they're all on the increase. And I think that, my point is, is, is everywhere across the board, you always hear people bitching about the woods are so freaking crowded now. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter hardly any, you know, all these, it's just across the board, almost every state. It just seems like the woods are so freaking, you have that same conversation with so many people and it's rifle hunters, it's muzzleloader hunters, it's, it's especially bow hunters. But, um, like when I went to Wyoming, it was incredible how many, like almost everybody was out of state for this antelope tag we got. It was incredible on public land. You could not literally not get away from people. And it was just like every original, like unique idea I had using Onyx to access this property through this little land bridge of BLM, like five other dudes had that same idea. Yeah. And it was like, God dang it. Like, I know, I know this is. And so my point would be is like, it sounded to me like you were saying we need to normalize hunting and, and get society to accept hunting as something that humans do and need to be a part of in order to not lose the ability which is basically to me saying we need to get more political traction we need to get more votes we need to get more people that are okay with with voting for pro hunting bills and anti hunting bills voting them down like that's kind of what i was hearing but you didn't actually say you did a good job of not giving me what i wanted so you know and i I, I, actually i can concede to that to an extent like uh, you know as as a hunter i don't want to see more hunters out there Mm -hmm. i i question i i ran the numbers on this at one point and and i don't remember what the conclusion was there's like this this weird variation of balance in terms of tags sold where there's there's some hunts that are way down compared to I, for some right. reason, I always compare things to the 1980s. It's probably because that's when I was born. <laughs> so <laughs> I always go back to 1980, you know, um, because when I look at it, Garrett, like when I remember, I remember my first deer hunt. I don't know what my dog is barking at. Hey, you stop that bark in the doors. <laughs> I had to open my I know, screen I didn't even door. Hear oh, okay. <clears throat> screen had to open. It is hot today. Anyway, um, I go back, I go back to my first hunt and, and I'm, it's the it's the fall. I had just started kindergarten, and I obviously I'm too young to carry a rifle. I'm not out there hunting, but I'm with my dad. He's got this old this old. Uh, have you ever seen these those old uh, pop up tent trailers where they don't have shit in them but beds? Right? There's no yeah. there's no <laughs> stove. There's no heater. There's yeah. no nothing. They're just a tent on a trailer. And we go out in one of those. 
we go we go up this mountain and and you know in my young mind I feel like I'm walking for hours and and we're just we must have covered miles but really we I, I doubt we even went a mile. The point is is there were hunters everywhere on the mountain. This this was mm-hmm. like 1985. There there were hunters everywhere and I remember we we helped one dude that shot this little forked horn. Uh, we helped him drag it back down off the mountain and and. Uh, you know that there were shots going off all over the place. It sounded like almost a, a damn combat zone, you know. And yep. so sometimes I wonder, you know, is it really more busy than it than it used to be, or is it that there's this balance shift as to the percentage of the population back in those days was much greater of those who hunted, and and it was, you know, sh- whole towns they would put banners up. Like coming through in the West, they would they would put banners on their gas stations. Hunters, welcome. Get your coffee yep. here, you know. And you know, yep, we still see those here. Yeah, yep. yeah, and I still see them here too, uh, periodically. And but but not like not like back then. And and school right. Well, if you down. see, it's all good. So if you see, um, you, like I've I've done all this, like I've done a ton of research into these things, and the numbers to me aren't conclusive because some studies show different. But let's just say they that do. My yeah, so you've done the research too. So it's hard to find a a a something finite that you can say this is the number. But so it's about fourteen to sixteen percent of the population um, from what I've seen hunts. Could you get on board with that? See, I actually found or, that it was four percent. I when when you four percent when you take now that's that's big game hunting. And so this is all hunting. Okay. So all hunting, I could, I, I, I don't know what, what I was looking at was big game hunting and roughly across the country, it was sitting just above 4%. And that's where okay. I got a little bit alarmed because I, I'd feel a lot better about that 12 to 14%. Yeah. I, I was, I was under the, so let's just say, let's just meet in the middle and say 8%. Okay. Cause the number, the number really doesn't matter that much to me. Um, the number that matters is 97%. And that is the amount of people that eat meat in America. And if we only yes. have 4%, like we'll take with your number, only 4% that hunt, we have a really good argument for those 97% of people out there that eat meat. Those are the voters and those are the people we should be focusing on. We don't need them to hunt. We just need them to vote the way we want. Exactly. We need to control yeah. the narrative and we need to make sure that we are proactive with these bills and go on the offense to make sure that we're putting the good information out there, not not social science, but real science. And Here's why if you eat meat. Here's why we eat meat. But here's why we are more involved with where, where it comes from. Here's, you know, like the whole organic spiel and all the, you know, we need to control the narrative because right now the squeaky wheel wins in politics. Right now, uh, whoever screams and, and dyes their hair purple wins. It just, yeah. it's just yeah. whoever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So we need to be, well, you need to dye your hair purple, Jim. But, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not, thinking uh, about it, dude. No, you need to, we need to be the squeaky will. I mean, we need to, we need to be the ones that are screaming and yelling. No, listen, this is what's right. This is how shit actually works. And this is more humane. And this is, this is like, we are part of the food chain and we are the only animals that have enough wherewithal and enough intelligence to have that ability to rein it in or take more so we have the ability to actually manage our environment around us we need to be involved we need to make sure that we aren't hunting where we shouldn't be hunting or we're taking more animals or more does or more bears more cougars in areas that we need them or wolves or whatever it may be and that wolves aren't endangered they aren't there's shit tons of wolves in the world we don't need them in areas where they haven't been because the elk herds already aren't doing it like we need to have that conversation out there and we don't need more hunters to do that um, because there's plenty of liberal hunters out there, which I, 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 I have no idea how the hell that somebody comprehends that. But there's a lot of liberal hunters out there. I, dude, I, I've I talked to a few it, of them. Man. Explain it for me because well, I have no fucking clue how somebody could be a liberal and also be pro hunting. And because, I hope I'm offending somebody because I, I really I, do. I, well, you know, when when you, anytime I put out an episode, brother, people are offended. Um, but here's the thing. This is going to be a good one then. So, so liberalism. Okay. The, the, the political dynamics have shifted there. There's, there's been a big giant shift. And a lot of these people that think they're liberals aren't actually liberals. So the Democrat party has been hijacked by these leftist, wokest, fanatical, crazed, dirty, rotten scoundrels, in my opinion, 
that are degrading the very essence and foundational principles that have made this country offer them the life that they can go out and protest and dye their hair purple and bitch about America while playing for our Olympic teams and, and things like this. They've, the Democrat Party has been hijacked. And I said this on a recent episode. Like, my brother-in-law, is a, he thinks he's a Democrat. He's a gun-toting, uh, freedom-loving Democrat that doesn't get enough exposure to what the real issues of political affairs are to understand that his party has been fucking hijacked and Trump ain't the enemy. <laughs> you know, he just, right. they, you know, right. they, they, they just, that's what's happened there. You're, you're talking about, you know, back in the day that, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hurt any Democrats feelings here, but, but the reality is, is back in the day, the Democrats, it's the Democrats that were the party of slavery. It's the Democrats that developed the Ku Klux Klan. It's the Democrats that fought against these uh, civil rights movements and, and, and even the, the, the rights for women to vote. When you look, when you look back through the political system of America, it, it was, if you, again, I don't mean to keep bringing up the Civil War. That was literally Republicans versus Democrats. And guess what? Mm-hmm. Lincoln, the guy that freed the slaves, he was a Republican. Was a Republican. Quit yep. fucking around and acting like you're the party that doesn't have any racism. Biden himself hung out with that Congressman Byrd or whatever his name was, who was an active member of the KKK. Like, don't <laughs> give me this shit. But see, these dynamics shift and change. And so it's like a lot of these guys that claim to be liberals are not actually liberals in the sense that you and I look at liberals at. Because we see these purple-haired freaks that don't know what bathroom to lose use. When your average Democrat from 20 years ago would not have gone for that, they they wouldn't have been on that side, and and they they still believed in foundationally as a country we are a, we are a, a, a capitalistic society. We believe in freedom. We want the government out of our shit. And we want to keep more of our money. That literally 20 years ago, most Democrats could get on board with that platform. That right, just right. My dad same. used to be a Democrat. Oh, yeah. yeah, and they were yeah, yeah. they were more for the working man and 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 yeah human for the rights. working like they, man they're le- yeah. against the corporatism and and you know now now we've got these liberals running Facebook and Google and and that talk about corporatism man like these pharmaceutical companies are run by a bunch of leftists that want to control your <laughs> life and tell you what shot you have to get like I'm sorry right. you you normal Democrats you have been abandoned. That is not the party that it used to be. And I understand that, you know, we get real hung up on these social issues such as like abortion and and birth control and 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 dumb things that like don't really uh, move the needle in, in terms of your day to day life. The, uh, you've been abandoned. So anyway, I just kind of wanted to explain that. Like if you asked this person that I, I identified earlier, um, my my brother-in-law, I guess I already said it. <laughs> if you went <laughs> right. through issue to issue, he would find quickly, he, he is a fucking Republican. He's a Republican. He just has always identified as a Democrat. And so... Right. And votes with anybody with a D in front of the name, probably. Exactly. And so yeah. that's, that's how we get these liberal hunters anymore, that you cannot be a card-toting leftist liberal and be a hunter because you are the party of anti-gun. You are the party of government control you are the party of gender misidentification and 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 this you know mutilating children thinking that that's that's like acceptable all these things that are right. just it, this this is not who they are and so well go ahead i agree and and i've got um step family that is extremely liberal the whole freaking family on that side is liberal and one I, of them's I like have that a too. Hun- hardcore hunter and and i'm like how are you and he's like he doesn't believe in ars and, and he doesn't believe in like we shouldn't have a lot of the rifles we have. Like he doesn't own an AR and believes anybody that has an AR and just extremely like, I'm like, I don't understand. Like, I do not understand him. He hunts with a rifle, but yet is anti-gun. Like yeah. I, I do not understand it's, that. That's but bizarre, man. It is bizarre. So I, I understand people. I understand the intent. I believe people really do want to do good out there. I, I try to believe in the best in people. And so for the folks that are like, you know, pro women's rights and all that stuff. And I, I, I see where your head's at and I, and I, I try to understand and, and I personally, I won't get into all that shit, but if you, if you are a sportsman and, and a hunter and a conservationist first, and you want to preserve hunting and, and, and fishing rights and outdoorsman rights, you can't vote with, a, a, for people with a D and, and honestly, Republicans are guilty of it too. I, I don't, after, after seeing what happened with Trump in 2016, 
um, and just seeing all the infighting in the, in the Republican Party and mm-hmm. what Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan and all these all these players, what they were doing, what they were saying and all the backstab thing. I'm like, I, I don't identify with any of them. Like, I I, I have no idea what I am now because I, I I guess maybe libertarian. I guess I have no idea. Yeah, like, I'm kind of I'm kind of there. There's. I, I'm pretty libertarian for the most part, man. I there, there's a couple things like the whole isolationist thing uh, doesn't bode well with me. But other than that, I, I'm fairly libertarian too. Yeah, I mean, I just it just seems like the values. I, I, honestly, I think it's all a scam. I think we're it's I all it's all meant to. Di- I think it's all meant to divide people. So I talk I talk a lot of shit about like Mitch McConnell should hang it up after that big freeze he had on the podium the other day. Did you if see people that, have man? a want Biden. It was horrible. Like I'm like, dude. It was. It's creepy. funny how they played that news. News people played that, but they don't. Yeah. They won't play the Biden fuck ups. But I know. Um, like, I know. I, all, I would. I would trade one for up. one. Yeah. I would trade one for one. Let's Me take too. Mitch McConnell out and let's take Biden out. Like let's. And then there's that one. Take, chick taking from, him out. Um, by, by the way, taking him out so for the Secret Service <laughs> listening. He's talking yeah. about removing them from office, not like. Yeah. Let's, let's put him on the bench. Put him on the bench. Not. I'm just clarifying so I don't get the Secret Service showing up at my front door. Right. Yeah, yeah but stay like away. we it, 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 it's it's gone to the point where Joe Rogan's made the best point. I, it's so tribal now. It's like, why are we so married to these parties that don't give a freaking shit about us? Like, I know, man, none of them like, like care about us. I, like, they're I, all rich. I I have no problem saying I will vote for Trump over Biden any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Right. But does Me does too. that mean that I think? Trump legitimately has my back as an individual American? I don't think so, man. I just, I'm sorry, I don't. I think he has my back more than Biden does, and I think he's less corrupt, and I think that he affects policy that is more beneficial to everyday Americans' lives. But I, right. d- do I think that, like, any Paul, uh, do I believe Mitch McConnell has my back? Fuck no. No. Uh, uh-uh. like Mitt Romney, give me a break. Like, that, none of these dudes. Guys, uh, yeah. And, and even even the Dan Crenshaw guy, that guy's yeah. still pound sand. Yeah, like, he's all I mean, over there's, the there's photos of him. Yeah, there's photos of him. Like, he, he's they're all politicians. They're all making money, millions of dollars off of not a million dollar salary. It's like, okay, this is, this is, like, I just I'm I'm ragging on liberals and Democrats, but I trust me that's where my head's at. Like I'll rag on the Republican Party too because oh yeah I'll, I don't think any equal, of them I don't think any of them have our back. Me and Garrett but, are equal opportunists. <laughs> everybody can get some, <laughs> but my point being is that if if you are a let's just say a Democrat and, and honestly I mean Republicans are all for giving land away to, to capitalists too. Like they are. They, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. So. It's it's on both sides here. You can't really win. You just have to pick the lesser of the two evils. But if you are a Democrat and you want to, hunting to be around, then ha- explain to me what what Biden is doing right now. The administration getting rid of shooting and hunting safety and archery courses for for students and kids. Like all that is on the chopping block right now. Yeah, where do you and, think and that came from? Like like I whose idea was that? <sighs> You know? I don't know where it, it came from the administration. So it probably came from the top down somewhere. Yeah. Um, it's not like the Ford commercial where somebody probably middle level had an idea and then ran with it, you know, and then I know, just I was pissed screwed about the that, whole man. company up. I was oh, pissed man. about that. I'm a Ford guy. So like I was, are you really, I was fucking livid. I'm, I wasn't so I like going. I, it's you. <laughs> no, I don't drink. At least I don't drink that Panther piss. But when Ford did that, I was I was pretty livid. I'm like, right. bitch, I have been a Ford oh, guy man. since I was a kid. Don't don't mess this well, up for me. My like I I don't I I'm gonna get my we're gonna piss a lot of people off here. So there's companies even in the hunting industry that it. people really need to focus on where they put their money. You vote with your dollar who you want to stay open, but you also vote for your dollar on where do you think that dollar will go after you spend it with them mm-hmm. for like example um a lot of people point to the churning group with meat eater okay or yeah. bha being a green decoy like who knows if they are or not i'm just going to throw that out there let's just say churning group okay um let's just say they are bad and it the profits do go to the churning groups some of them and that does go to anti our cause you're voting you're, you're fighting against you're giving the opposition the money they need to fight you right like there's there's other companies that aren't um if people did their homework there's a couple there's one manufacturer in particular i'm not going to say it because i want to deal with all that drama but um there's a broadhead manufacturer that is extremely like hardcore liberal but people don't do their research and people don't understand that 
well, I should do, be able do, to buy who you, I want. You'll like text me that broadhead campaign. I, I, I will. I will text you. I. I'll, Maybe I'll, we don't I'll, want to rip them apart on we'll the show. We'll talk about it off air. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah we'll talk about it off, off air. air. I don't. I don't want that heat because people need to do their own research. But um, and if you guys want to know, want just hit heat. me up, Jim of the Western Hunter. <laughs> and and I like the guy personally. Like I I like the guy, but if I'm spending money with him and he is so politically charged, right? That he he is so politically charged that in my mind, if I'm giving him money, that money very likely is going to be benefiting anti-hunting cause or you know it's it's going to go into the wrong yeah. causes if he's that politically charged and so god i'm I mean, dying wondering yeah. who the hell this is but um, yeah so my my point being is like politics do matter but spending your money also does matter too so i guess people need to figure out and do a gut check is abortion in you know in lgbtq plus rights are those more important than than being able to feed your family and, and have access to organic free range, big game meat. And, and like, what are your priorities here? Cause you keep voting the way they are. If you want people to do that stuff. But if you, if you really do value hunting rights and you really do value all these access things and, and all these important issues, then, then maybe just don't vote either Republican or Democrat, just vote a different way. Or, but you have to like realize putting somebody in, in, in Trump wasn't great in all areas too, for access. Like no one's perfect here. Yeah. But he is the lesser of two evils. Uh, not it's not even fucking close. Yeah, not not even close. I mean, re- remember when it was like um, McCain and Obama? Remember, remember that election? <laughs> that was like okay. There's like the lesser of two evils. Blah blah blah. Right. Obviously, I'm not going to vote for a Democrat, so I went that way. But right. but like and then McCain but, turned out to be uh, off the deep end. Yeah, you know, but if you if you so. look at like between Trump and Biden, I mean, come on. Are you fucking kidding well, me? Like I don't know. Look at the, how, I, I'm sorry. Yes. Why are we not screaming about four dollar gas still? We've all just gotten used to four dollar gas, and that's Biden's fault. I'm sorry. I was paying less than two bucks a gallon with Trump, yeah. and, and that's the kind of stuff that matters to me. And so uh, I, I was talk- doing better. We were doing better when when Trump was in office. Granted, yeah. I mean, it was it was prior to COVID, but. You know, I mean, in, in, in economies and climates are all unique. Like the, the time that that Trump was in office is not the current time that we're in right now. Like we went through COVID and now we're going through recovery and and, you know, all that recovery and all the re- regaining of jobs. I mean, Biden can claim can claim that's him, but that's just the economy restarting itself, in my opinion. Well, it's, it's not nobody it's could not have been Biden. in office and that shit probably would have happened. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 jobs that um <laughs> These jobs existed pre-COVID, and then they were shut down, and now now they're coming back. Like, uh, come on, it, it, Biden didn't right. create jobs. He couldn't he couldn't create a common cold <laughs> out of a coke can, man. But I I just I, I want to I want to <laughs> get back to the the topic of you know the the public. Yeah, you know I've said on this show a, a few times, and I I know we're running long, dude. You you good for a few more minutes? Um, I'm I'm good. yeah. My wife is I think wanting to go hit a, hit a few golf balls, but I'm good. Um, give me about. Five more minutes. If okay. That, if that All works right. for you. I, I just, I, I, I want to just like highlight and recognize that the, the common ground that came out of this is, wh- I, I, again, I've said this on the podcast a few times. That when you, when you take a look at the populace in the United States and Canada, uh, actually, let's take Canada out because it gets a little squampus sometimes with um, their political system. So, uh, so just looking at the United States. You have 100% of the population. You've got roughly anywhere from 4 to 14% of, of that population that is either previously an active hunter or is an active hunter every year. You know, the, a season, right. uh, uh, you, you know, the, because there are those dudes out there. You know, there's uh, these people that get a deer tag like once every 10 years kind of thing, and they're, they're, they're happy with that. Uh, so they would fall under that. But And then you have... Let, let's call that five five percent as it, when you're looking at active every year tag holders. Right. Uh, that that's what we're looking at, and then you have you have this population as somewhere between four and five percent that is very loud and very active and very organized and very well funded. These are anti hunting activist groups. Mm-hmm. Any anything from like PETA to the um you know uh Sierra the, Club Sierra Club to Center for Biological Diversity to the the big yep. Mac Daddy that I'm drawing a blank on for some reason which is like my public enemy number one and I can't think of their name for some reason. <laughs> anyway, I'll think of it. Um Pete or you said Peter. <laughs> yeah, Peter Peter they're so extreme. I don't think they have a lot of credibility. I, I'm not worried about them. Um 
uh, Humane Society of the United States. That's that's the one. HSU. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh-huh. So okay. So that's uh, be, between those two groups, hunters and and then the active anti hunters. That that you're going to make somewhere between eight to ten percent of the population in the United States. That leaves us roughly ninety percent of the populace. Where we had we had talked about, um, you know, you you said ninety seven percent of the population eats meat, and there was yes. a recent study that suggested roughly eighty six percent of the population is uh, in favor of hunting. Um, unless you do it under the guise of being a trophy hunter, which that changes, that's because of propaganda anyway. But correct, you and I can agree that it's that population, that large mass of roughly ninety percent of the population that are not active hunters and they're not anti hunters. That's who we have to focus on. Exactly. Those are the those are the people that we need to tell these stories to, and that's how we as hunters start needing to come together. And quit ripping on each other over what kind of broadhead we're using and, and FOCs right. and whatnot and, and figure out a game plan as to how to message hunting and, and, and offer it to the general public by way of storytelling and livelihood and, and humanity that maybe they don't understand so that when it does come down to it, it's not just 4% stakeholders. It's over 90%. They're like, you know, the hunters, this, uh, this whole, North American model of wildlife conservation, you know, they're on to something with this. They're, they're, they're the ones that are, that are conserving these animals and creating these public lands that are, that are wildlife uh, heavy. And, and, and this is why we can drive through some of these national forests and see the elk in the river and, and see the deer in the meadow. And, uh, you know, it's thanks to hunters. And, and that's the story I think we need to tell. We just need to figure out how to package that and deliver it to, uh, that's a big amount of people to deliver that to. Oh, a hundred percent. And and I, after listening to you there, I think you are right. I think it is 4% and it's four, it's like 12 to 16 million is how many hunters we have on. It's somewhere in there, um, in the U S. So I was, yeah. I think I was, I was, I was conflating my numbers or switching them around, but my, my whole point with the, with the hunter population is that the population of the U S is growing and let's just say it mm-hmm. stays at 4%. We're getting, hundreds of thousands of more hunters just because the population is growing as a whole not four percent is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and we're not getting much more public access anymore and i i feel like yeah. that is why that is why it feels so crowded in the woods because the population is growing up and there is more people in the woods even though it may still only be four percent it's you know when i was a kid it was like 300 million now we're up to 330 something million or something like that yeah, like so that 30 million that four percent of 30 million do the math on that that's a lot of people yeah so you know 10 percent would be um you know 30 what 30 three, three million people three million divide that by two that's 1.5 and then go so you know you're looking at it like 101 point what 1.2 million more people hunting let's just mm-hmm. say a million more yeah. people hunting so yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot of extra people. Yeah, and that so is. that's where I that's where I formulated my my argument is like we don't need more hunters because the woods aren't we're not getting any more woods typically. I mean, maybe a few rare occurrences where we get more opportunity, but we're getting millions of more hunters, you know, all the time. We're getting all these extra hunters, but we need more voters. And that's that was my whole argument about the the debate is we don't want more vote hunters. We want more voters. And I think you're on the same page of that. Um, yeah, as I, well. I think, I think for the most part I am, I, I, w- what I, what I like the concept of from, from my standpoint is like when, when families gather at Thanksgiving, I feel like every family should have that one person, male or female, that, that can tell a good hunting story, you know, and, and I think that that's <laughs> right. what's lacking. And so that, you know, we, we have so many families that gather at Thanksgiving that, that don't have that. And, and that is what, that's what kind of offers that humanity, that level of humanity to what hunting is and why it's beneficial. But dude, I know you got to run brother, but, uh, we, we should do this again. Yeah. I mean, we, I'm sure we pissed off a lot of people there and, and, um, no, that's cool. There's plenty more to piss off. I, I, I don't care, but, uh, (laughs) people, people can at me all they want. Um, so it's, I would love to have this conversation and it's one that needs to be had and I wanted to talk to you about this debate for over a year now, probably because I know guy where I texted you and guy and we're like, let's do it. And then we're like, we just couldn't match our schedules up. So I I think we're pretty much on the same page. I'd be curious to see guys uh, in insight on this. He's pretty, he's pretty freaking insightful, man. Guy will surprise. Yeah. I, it was so long ago when I did all my research, I wish I had my numbers in front of me so I could have had a, a, you know, a more intelligent conversation as far as the numbers were, but we're, we're ballparking it pretty close. I think so. Um, Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 
yeah. So, but yeah, anytime you want to have me back on, man, I, I appreciate it. And, um, you know, I love what you're doing and, and you just, I just love a, a guy that's wanting to go out and get information that's humble and who's a grinder on public like I am. And, and, um, and I just love a lot of respect for what you do and who you are. Now, brother, the feeling's mutual. I, uh, I really look up to you. I think, uh, you know, I, you're, you're one of those hunters that you're just so much fun to watch. You could, you know, uh, you're just so solid and, and you're humble uh, about it. You're not one of these guys that comes at it with this giant ego and, and, you know, I'm better than you. And here's why my opinion matters more than anybody else's. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I am, I, you did surprise me, man. You're pretty articulate for a drummer. <laughs> right. <laughs> left, right, left, left, right. Yeah. <laughs> did a little paradiddle of the words there. I was, yeah, that's that's what I was going for. The, <laughs> so, yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Let's seriously, let's do this again. I I, I hate golf, but I I got to let you go so you can you can go hit some golf balls. I, I think she took off without me. Um, <laughs> so oh wow. She's got her. We we uh, we got a golf membership this year for the first time. She bought me one, um, and I I kind of fell in love with golf this spring. Um just because I couldn't make it out in the woods as much and stuff. But yeah. I, 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 uh, I just, yeah, really fell in love with it. And it's, it's, it's harder than bow hunting. And I, I'm, a, I'm attracted to the things that are difficult. So well, good for it, you, man. Yeah. So, but Get it's fun, man. And, and, um, yeah, just let me know when you want to do it again and, and we'll make it work. All right, brother. Sounds good. Well, you have a great night and, uh, seriously, thanks again. That, that was a lot of fun. I, I love, I love being challenged like that. I, I feel like we need to have more of these kind of conversations. And 100%. Hey, we, we thought we disagreed. We thought we disagreed. And it turns out we agree. <laughs> so, you know, the bottom line and, is... And we're still friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think I think a lot of people can learn from the fact that maybe we, we have a little different angle. But in, at the end of the day, we want the same thing, man. And We want the same the thing. That's the key. Yep. So we just got to figure out how to do it. <laughs> Sounds right. good, man. I appreciate it. Have a great night, man. We'll talk soon. You too, brother. See ya. All right. Bye-bye. You made it. That's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please make sure you're following us on Instagram at the Western Huntsman and write us a good review at Apple Podcasts. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.